Whoa, 1980 was 40 years ago? Well, that explains the gray in my beard, no hair on my head, and the cocaine addiction. 1980 is the year which brought us classics such as The Empire Strikes Back, Airplane, and The Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. It was the year in which we lost Alfred Hitchcock but gained an exterminator. The year which gave us mega hits and mega bombs, some of which with the actual word bomb in the title. In this special Cinema Snob episode, we're going to take a long, hilarious journey through the trailers for all the major movie releases of 1980. From January to December, from historical Jesuses to historical Dudleys, this is 1980 in movies. Please tell your friends we'll do this once a year. As you may have guessed, 1980 cinema began in a very human way, with someone having to go back inside because they accidentally forgot their keys in the 70s. I want to tell you about how I got married. <laughs> Whoa, this is Sidney Lumet's Just Tell Me What You Want, i.e. You're going to be getting Dynasty sooner rather than later. This comedy stars Ali McGraw, Alan King, and Bizarre Cuts. Cut off all the garages. He's rich. He's powerful. I can blackball anybody she tries to sell the apartment to. Her. <laughs> 12 Angry Men, Dog Day Afternoon, and Network have nothing on Just Tell Me What You Want. God, it's like the War of the Roses or that old feeling of its time. Is the whole movie just them beating the shit out of each other? Weirdly, seductively? I want you... Hello. I want you... I want you to say you love me. Why do I feel there was as many people masturbating to this as there were in a porno theater? Well, I guess viewers didn't want this movie because it wasn't exactly a hit, but they also didn't want the other film released on January 18th either, which was Windows. It only took two movies to find one that was featured on the cinema snob. Windows was the controversial lesbian stalker movie that was the only film directed by Gordon Willis, famed cinematographer of The Godfathers. So, I mean, the movie looked pretty. The trailer makes it look like The Shining is breaking into her apartment. You settle down, The Shining. You'll get your chance later. There's nothing in this trailer that suggests what the movie is really about, and it doesn't even show the best part, which was Elizabeth Ashley being terrifying. This makes it look like a home invasion movie. Like if you saw a trailer that looked like Misery, but what you got was multiple maniacs. 1980 clearly needs some Jesus. And by that, I mean the historical Jesus from the makers of In Search of Noah's Ark and Beyond and Back. In Search of Historical Jesus comes prepared with dates. April 6, 33 AD. On a hillside near Jerusalem, a man was killed in an agonizing crucifixion. But not too agonizing. After all, we are the only rated G movie here, as it's showing us over an image of a man slowly dying. These are effects I feel like we'd see in an Estes Perkel movie. But it says it's a documentary, so I guess all this happened. There are 18 years of Jesus' life the Bible doesn't account for. Where did he spend those missing years? He was drinking with his friends in the basement and sneaking off to Denny's at one in the morning. Why didn't you tell me the book came directly from heaven? That explains everything! Though if I want to see anything on the Shroud of Turin, I'll watch the Unsolved Mysteries episode, thank you very much. Also, I'm nowhere near San Diego. So, how long does it take to find another movie from the Cinema Snob? Wow, there really are a lot of episodes of my show. No, we haven't jumped to December. This Christmas horror film, To All a Good Night, was released on January 30th, like all great Christmas movies. I've got selective memory, so I'm going to pretend this movie was about a bunch of girls just doing some light-hearted joshing. Oh, wait, Red Filter. That's right, one of them died. If I blur my eyes, I can't tell if I'm watching Pieces or To All a Good Night. But a karate guy didn't jump out at her, so I guess it's To All a Good Night. The trailer had better leave the audience with a good stinger. <laughs> It's no garbage day. 
After that nonsense, let's go into February with some class. Once upon a time, there was a little boy who loved to eat. And so he grew up to be a big boy. Great, we had to go back to 1980 for the Brad Tries biography. This is Fatso, or rather a list of things not to eat. Seems more like a list of challenges for the will it fit guy. You can't stop me from sneaking these items into a movie theater. Fatso was the only feature written and directed by Anne Bancroft, but was the first movie produced by Mel Brooks's Brooks Film Company. Did we need to make a movie for Dom DeLuise to go on a diet? Not give me these keys, no matter what. Also, is this a sitcom pilot? And so he ate. Oh, my bad. It's the lost pilot for another Incredible Hulk series. Plus, it's a love story now. My name is Dom. Wait, is he playing himself? I really hope this movie is like the comedy version of the love scene from Mitchell. You know, this may be 1980, but I'm not really feeling an 80s vibe yet. That is, until this next movie. There, it's officially 1980. When we were all Americans and all gigolos. You know who I am. I do. You're the freaking man. Paul Schrader's American Gigolo is such a sleaze classic, you don't need me to tell you what it's about. He is the American Gigolo. Unfortunately, someone watched this and thought to themselves, oh, never mind this style and sex appeal, can Rob Schneider make a shitty comedy out of it? Also, he might be Batman. This movie is like a Frank T.J. Mackey instruction manual. How do you do it, Julian? How do you seduce all these women? Because he's Richard Gere and you're not. Sure, he's accused of murder, but he's being handsome about it. I highly suggest you check out Call Me. I mean, American Gigolo, sorry. Richard Gere was the real hero of the week of February 8th, even though the other movie that weekend did have hero in the title. But help is on the way. Mind if I drop in? Captain Avenger! kick-ass of the 80s. I feel like a lot of John Ritter movies could also serve as random channels that he was zapped into and stay tuned. But it is Ritter, so you do have my interest. If they're gonna use real bullets, I think I'll retire. Ritter is seriously funny, and his superhero disguise may be obvious, but arguably no better than any other superhero disguises. And I think it has the same twist as the Mandarin from Iron Man 3. But he's really just an actor who got carried away with a role. Or maybe he's fatso. So this superhero is an actor playing a superhero. Add some Mormonism and a stunt cock and you got yourself orgasmo. Shockingly, horror fans did not get their fill of horror with To All a Good Night. But luckily, John Carpenter's The Fog is heading to shore, along with Adrian Barbeau's sexy voice and a history lesson. 100 years ago, between midnight and one, something unknown came out of the fog. Oh great, now we have In Search of the Historical Fog. The Fog is brilliant. It's like someone dared John Carpenter to make a movie out of Scooby-Doo ghost pirates and actually make it scary. And he did. <laughs> Though it wasn't too hard to get Jamie Lee Curtis to scream around this era. Good thing the trailer doesn't give away the conclusion of them blowing their own brains out inside their vehicle. Oh, wait, I may be confusing this with something else. And I don't know if this is the tagline you want to use. Get inside and lock your doors. Why? It's one of the best options for movies this weekend. Yet it keeps telling me to stay inside. Between midnight and one, it will find you. Good. Joke's on you. I'm asleep by then. We had a lot of firsts in 1980, like the Blues Brothers being the first movie based on SNL characters, but also there were lasts, like the last married couple in America. No one was ever married again after this. It's the story of a rocky relationship and marriage. Isn't it a little early to remake Just Tell Me What You Want? I guess they weren't quick to preserve this movie, since the trailers you find are just a single scene from the film, none of which feature the movie's co-star, Natalie Wood, in what was her last theatrical release before her death. 
I guess director Gilbert Cates had other things to focus on. He had two movies released in 1980. A book two, if you will. So there were five movies released on February 8th. We got a sleaze flick classic, superhero comedy, horror, something that seems like a melodrama poll choice on Patreon. But where's an option for the family? Allow me to explain why I've gathered you all here. Um, Revenge of the Nerds auditions? Yes, Midnight Madness, the movie about the classic all-nighter game where one of them is secretly a werewolf. Oh, I know who it is. Hi, David. So how do you win the Midnight Madness? The ultimate game that requires sophisticated strategy. <laughs> By doing your best impression of King Frat. This is 1980, when even a Walt Disney movie looks like it could be a raunchy, porky-style comedy. We're going into more cinema snob territory for this next one, and it's a snob tie-in to end all snob tie-ins. Other movies in 1980 can just go home. They spoke of it first in whispers. Then it took the media by storm. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Coal Miner's Daughter! Oh right, Caligula. I should know. They spoil the ending right in the trailer. I guess it's the only climax they could show. Hell, I think this whole trailer features the only scenes they could show from the entire movie. Penthouse's Bob Guccione produced this historical epic with class. No treachery could equal his evil. No evil was more treacherous. This was when even the trailer announcer sounded like he was alone in a room with you and his pants were down. What other movies did this play in front of? Was there a family at Midnight Madness saying, There's a dude in bed with a horse. We gotta see this. Look at the all-star cast. Malcolm McDowell, Helen Moran, Peter O'Toole, John Gielgud. In Romeo and Juliet. Oops, uh, Caligula. Close enough. That's where they got some of the music from. See it for yourself and for the ass on your stomach. No rumor can match the reality. I heard that Caligula has gotten so fat and he's losing his hair. The movie calls itself the most controversial film ever made. Bold statement considering the other movie released that week. A New York City detective is about to disappear into the night. That's right, can't stop the music. Or William Friedkin's Cruising, a film that is sadly credited as being one of the films that helped put an end to the new Hollywood era, but Cruising is an underrated masterpiece, like a mainstream giallo that pulls no punches and does a lot of other things with a fist, too. And... It's as American as pissing on your leg. Windows was for the ladies. Cruising is for the fellas. As Detective Al Pacino goes undercover to find a serial killer in the gay S&M scene. Doesn't matter if you're a comedy or a thriller in 1980. You're watching someone through the window. Not to mention... Yes! Causing the same dude who masturbated to just tell me what you want to masturbate to this one, too. This is like Al saw the Al Pacino scene from Saturday Night Fever, slathered himself with Crisco, and said, I can pose in front of the mirror, too. And Caligula and Cruising weren't the only classics released on February 15th. American International presents Mad Max. It didn't matter what you saw on February 15th, it was gonna contain a lot of leather. While it had a 1979 release in Australia, it got a 1980 release for the States, and Mad Max advertised itself like the Toxic Avenger is gonna put a stop to this at any second. Yeah, this is fine and all, but where's David A.R. White, the Holy Scripture, and Kevin Sorbo with a bad accent? <laughs> Speaking of accents... Scoot jockeys? Yeah, no man trash. Well, I'll add it to my thread collection. Where the hell is Mel Gibson's voice? Oh right, the dubbed version for Americans. <laughs> we don't speak Australian. It's so cool seeing the origin story of Immortan Joe in his toe-cutter days. 
But it is very hard to watch this movie nowadays after finding out about the horrible things Mel's car said about Chevrolets. But can't say the movie didn't warn us! You don't want to make Max mad, because when Max gets mad, he gets evil. Max leaves you with a stern message on your answering machine, pops out your eyes, and blows you the hell up. You best not answer the phone. Don't answer the phone. Because that's exactly what this next movie is! It's a purple brand trailer too, so it's Grimace approved. I can't answer the phone or do anything else according to this movie. Run, if you must. Sorry, I'm already comfortable sitting down. I'm sure this is exactly the kind of movie you want if you're already struggling with paranoia. He is out there, somewhere in the crowd, beside you, ready to kill again. Well, not only am I going to remain seated, but I'm never going outside again. I killed and raped them all. No one can stop me. Damn, the first quarter of 1980, and already movies are trying to out-sleaze each other. At least back then you could see the uncut version of the movie. The 2001 Rhino DVD was a censored version that cut out nine minutes. Mm, gee, thanks. If it's some lighter fare you want, there was director Adrian Lin's debut with Foxes, which got way better reviews than Don't Answer the Phone. However... Meet Jeannie, Annie, Madge, and Deirdre. Oh no, I'm not falling for your jailbait. These girls are living the dream. They dare to do what others dream of. Getting fake IDs and going to see Foxes. Sure, there may be some tomfoolery in this coming-of-age film, but some of it I'm gonna need a little more context for. Other things, I don't know if I want the context! I'm in love with you. Do you really love me? I feel like I'm falling on deaf ears saying this, but don't be weird, Randy Quaid. And this is why only half of the 1980s teenagers made it out of the decade alive. Though some of the cast went on to win an Oscar. Jodie Foster. Scott Bale. One of those two has a career. The other will probably yell at me on Twitter about that joke. Going from one directorial debut to another, the ninth configuration was the debut of exorcist novelist William Peter Blatty as a director, who also wrote and produced the film based on his novel. The film begins with a more comedic tone, before going into much darker territory in the second half, laying the groundwork for Last American Virgin, obviously. The film wasn't a hit, but did get strong reviews and Golden Globe nominations, and later had redistribution with a re-edit in 1985 for New World Pictures. In other markets, the movie would be known as Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, which sounds like something the killer from Don't Answer the Phone would say before gutting someone. The movie certainly has my attention. The last of these, number 18, was highly experimental in nature and was set up in an old abandoned castle in the Pacific Northwestern United States. Even though I feel like I'm going into a slideshow lecture, it's blatty, so I've already shit my pants. But March is here, the weather is getting nicer, and it's time to get funky! Well, I was born. Ooh, clearly a disco movie! It's Coal Miner's Daughter. Can't show much of the first part given the giant soundtrack. As for the other lines... Loretta's getting to be a woman. Going on 14. <laughs> you saw foxes on opening night, didn't you? This is the story of country music legend Loretta Lynn, which would lead to a Best Actress Oscar for Sissy Spacek and a nomination for Tommy Lee Jones, plus an honorary Oscar for marital advice. Promise me, boy, don't you never hit her. Sure, they could get each other a grammar textbook, but this guitar will be much better. You boys, stop fighting and listen to me sing, huh? Mom, can't we watch Super Friends? We just want to watch Super Friends. Just imagine the rose, but with less heroin and more Coors Light. I don't want to spoil the ending, but at the end, Loretta gets turned into a doll. Whatever, this is the cinema snob. I don't need to see this. Clearly, I need the mockbuster Country Music Daughter, which was a retitled 1976 movie. Look, if you want to take the kids to something, there was a Lady and the Tramp reissue that weekend. Or wait until the next weekend. Summer's getting closer, which means a Jerry Bruckheimer movie is here. He was a stranger. 
he's on his way to be spliced into a Godfrey Ho-looking Rambo Bronson knockoff. Jan Michael Vincent is going to clean up all the crime in this city. The finish, big man. Oh, sorry, sir. You want the cruising theater next door. This is one of those trailers that tells us the hero doesn't want to do anything. He wanted no part of their problem. He wanted no part of their world. That is, until the title drops. Until he taught them. Defiance. Yes, he sat them all down and showed them a Daniel Craig war film. But given the soundtrack change, I think I know how it ends. Jan Michael Vincent. Teresa Saldana. He teaches them to boogie. But did you get kicked out of Lady and the Tramp for taking LSD and freaking out in the rat scene? Well, don't go into the other movie theater showing Forbidden Zone. Just keep saying to yourself, it's only a movie. Great, someone injected Last House on the Left with a speedball again. Forbidden Zone was written, produced, and directed by Richard Elfman, co-starring his brother Danny Elfman, with music by Danny as well. It's like someone wished to trip balls on Fantasy Island with a little help from Monty Python-style animation on speed. This sets up, not just being a cult film popular in the midnight movie scene, but years of emails asking if I'd ever do an episode on this movie. No one ever asks that about the next movie, Little Miss Marker. Also, hey YouTube movies, if it's just a clip of the film, it's not a trailer. Stop labeling it as such. Little Miss Marker is a remake of the 1934 Shirley Temple movie, this time starring Walter Matthau, Tony Curtis, and Bob Newhart before being elected president later in the year. Unlike Shirley, though, this would be the only acting credit for co-star Sarah Stimson. I guess Walter had only one kid to teach baseball then. I hope that's what it's about. She's my girl, Starfall. You're not scared of Blackie, are you? Again, I need a lot more context for both of those things. Can't say this movie left its marker. <laughs> Little Miss Marker, rated PG, starts Friday at a theater near you. I wasn't born yet, so I'll have to take your word on that. You know, after movies like To All A Good Night and Don't Answer the Phone, I'd think a movie with a name like Serial would be another slasher film, but... The Beamer in County things are not as they... I don't think there's gonna be any slashing in this. Serial is a Martin Mull Tuesday Weld comedy with hippies, women's rights, dumb dudes, and even a plot synopsis that says, don't try to keep up. It's based on the 1977 novel, The Serial, by Sarah McFadden, and the movie looks like if Menachem Golan's The Apple wasn't laced with poison, and it has more bratty kids than the last movie. And every precocious child. Be careful, spanking was still a thing back then. This is all kinds of confusing. It's a comedy, yet titled like a horror movie, and looks like it's gonna commit a human sacrifice. I mean, even Christopher Lee is there! It's even getting interrupted by Dad clearly running late to ruin a weird science party. What is this movie? Serious. You don't eat it. You see it. I guess you'd have to be on drugs for that to make any sense. Enough of quirky shit, I need something manly. This is the 80s, goddammit. In 1903, one of the last great American heroes alive was Tom Horn. Damn, I thought it was gonna be President Teddy Roosevelt. After taking a chance on the drama Enemy of the People, Steve McQueen's career hit a slump, turning down Close Encounters, pricing himself out of Raise the Titanic, so Tom Horn was a comeback attempt, but sadly was also a box office and critical disappointment. $200 for every wrestler to go somewhere else to fly his trade. Maybe because the trailer wasn't all that exciting. Despite obvious setups for immature jokes. <laughs> Great, the Earth just farted. Noticing signs of lung cancer during the production, McQueen would have one more film later in 1980, which did almost twice the box office as Tom Horn. Steve McQueen is Tom Horn, who became a legend. I mean, McQueen, yeah. Tom Horn, not so much. Oh, you still going? Sorry, can I move on? Because time is running out! 
There is an active volcano. Irwin Allen, William Holden, Paul Newman. These are veterans of the Towering Inferno, which makes it weird that it's the same weekend as Tom Horn. This was also definitely not a hit. It was a disaster big enough to help end that particular wave of Hollywood disaster movies. Even Paul Newman cited it as a movie he regrets making. It looks like a full-length version of Kentucky Fried Movies' That's Armageddon. Especially when you watch the later home video trailer, which feels even more like a parody. There's not going to be any evacuation. Another non-believer. Won't they ever learn? Um, did the trailer guy take his smart-ass pills? That's some kiss. Passion that really sparks. But this sucker makes Mount St. Helens look like a kid's sparkler. Why even cinema snub this when the trailer guy is doing it? Damned irresponsible conclusion on your part. You said that already. Okay, anyway, there's plenty more in this big name cast. Alex Karras, Pat Morita. Eh, we don't mind spoiling his death. Uh, excuse me, but don't we have any other explosions? Thank you. Oh, sorry. My jokes are interrupting the jokes. Someone take the trailer guy's booze away from him and give it to me. I've got a hell of a lot more trailers to get to after this. And now, preview time. Not only are we at the start of April, but we've got a movie released on April 1st. Happy April Fool's Day. The Baltimore Bullet is here for classic pranks. Hide your women, lock up your cash. They are robbing and raping. The Baltimore Bullet is a pool hustler movie starring James Coburn, Bruce Boxleitner, Ronnie Blakely, and Pool Talk. Welcome to a world of con and hustle. Well, this is it, sugar. Office. Look, we got six years to kill before The Color of Money comes out, and video stores are kinda limited right now, so we can't exactly go out and rent The Hustler. There's something about this trailer that feels like it could instantly insert porn. I feel a little strange in this position. Well, how does this feel? Damn, should have listened to their warning to hide the women. Is this even about pool? I got 20 bucks says they're silicone. Two guys who'll make any bet in town. You got a bed sucker. Good lord, it's a full three minute trailer because they keep getting easily distracted. Not to mention Freddy Krueger just zapped Nancy's mom into country music daughter. Who knew that a friendly game of pool could result in so much tomfoolery? Okay, I think I get the gist of this movie. In their 15 year pursuit of fortune, fame, and most of all, the Deacon. Oh, sorry, is there more plot in this trailer? Forgot we gotta introduce Omar Sharif's Montana Fats. And it's gotta remind us it is still about pools sometimes. It's the Baltimore Bullet, not on video anywhere near you. It's never been released on DVD in the States. If you want a copy of the Baltimore Bullet, you better contact the private eyes. Woof. At least with Baltimore Bullet, it reminded me of the greatness of the color of money. With the private eyes, I'm unfortunately getting ghost fever foreshadowing. The film stars Tim Conway and Don Knotts in the funniest film of 1975. Better send it off to the yard and let them know we're here. Okay, well, that was funnier than anything in Holmes and Watson. Joking aside, the movie actually was a decent hit and made $18 million against a $2 million budget, making it the highest grossing New World Pictures film under Roger Corman. I kind of wish this had been the introduction to the Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe and not Scoob. This is leaving shenanigans to the professionals. Tim Conway is the dim-witted Dr. Todd, and Don Knotts is the inept Inspector Winship. I don't think you needed to remind me that our heroes are dim-witted and inept. Clearly, we have to go from one art film to another, hence Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker, which got a limited 1980 release in the States. Stalker is the story of obsessing over the Twitter accounts of people you hate. Or not, I'm only pretending I've seen this film, because Bergman said that Tarkovsky is the greatest of them all. 
in reality, he was talking about his Tetris skills. Just give me more quotes and beautiful scenery because I have already written my positive review. That's because I'm reviewing it now. In 1980, the movie actually got mixed reviews, though later becoming rather acclaimed. Much like the other misunderstood masterpieces of the time, like The Shining and In Search of Historic Jesus. We're getting another warning for this next film. It's rated R, but not Purple Band R, so I feel safe. Ooh, -hoo, Bill Murray, this means we're gonna see an uncut display of meatballs. In Where the Buffalo Roam, Bill Murray plays legendary gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Dr. Hunter S. Thompson. This definitely sets up for the future cult hit, The Razor's Edge. Um, I mean, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Where the Buffalo Roam was not a hit and is still critically panned, with even Thompson hating it, but Bill Murray got good reviews. You know, I, I hate to advocate drugs or liquor, violence, insanity to anyone. But in my case, it's worked. Because... <laughs> He's Bill Murray. The film was criticized for mainly being a series of sketches, and the Baltimore bullet continually sneaking into girls' rooms. There's so much zaniness here, it looks like the writer's room for King Frat. Out of the truth! The sky. <laughs> Never mind, it's coming in with hardcore Animal House energy. It's based on Thompson's The Banshee Screams for Buffalo Meat and Strange Rumblings in Aztlan, if they were both written in streams of urine on the snow. And that's all the films in April. Four whole movies! It was a simpler time before every month had 17 movies and was blockbuster season. But let's see how May of 1980 kicked off the summer. What are you doing out in this mess? It doesn't matter, because everyone's now dead before summer officially starts! You know you're dealing with an expert on the series when the trailer uses a thumbnail for part six. Hell, the trailer even shows you how numbers work. One. <laughs> Two. Oh, ha ha, rubbing it in that Crazy Ralph can't count. And clearly, three should be in 3D. Friday the 13th is obviously the very first slasher movie called Friday the 13th. But why see the movie when the trailer is already showing you the deaths? Although we won't learn that the killer isn't Michael Myers, but is Amanda Krueger killing people with silver shamrock masks. On the plus side, the trailer easily wins the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game. And thus we have one of the first Critics Be Damned movies of the 80s. You may only see it once. Because even the trailer guy is snobby about it. Is that really how you want to sell your movie? Mmm, seeing it once is enough. Gotta soak this in before it inspires a high percentage of trailers I'll be getting to in future episodes. If you're not in the mood for slashers, though, Get Smart's Maxwell Smart is back in the nude bum. 36, 22, 34. Damn, the trailer guy won't stop counting. I get it, you like numbers! I would have figured it'd have been Friday the 13th that had the word nude in the title. But it was the comedies that reference being naked. You've heard of the naked gun, but would you believe the nude bomb? No, this is 1980. I haven't seen the naked gun yet. I'm guessing this is a post-1988 video trailer. I suppose this will satisfy my police squad cravings. You cannot be too careful with your gun. It's okay, Inspector Gadget has a robot penis. This is stapler telephone action. Although I don't know if I feel safe with these fools in charge. What did he say? He wants you to put your hand in his groin. See, now we have to hide our women from people in comas. Guess they shouldn't have put bomb in the title, since, as I implied earlier, the movie was one. But we still got Don Adams back and Get Smart Again. But just when you started feeling a little too stereotypically 1979, stereotypical 80s are back in fame. For Coco, it's the stardom. For Ralph, it's a chance. For Leroy, it's survival. And all of them will learn to electric boogaloo. 
they are living the dream of the dance. Cause I'm gonna be a dancer, a good dancer. You know who says so? Sir, this is Suspiria. We just need to know if your guts look good on camera. Okay, enough jokes. Get to the song. I'm gonna live yes, the Irene Cara classic flash dance. What a fame or something. Fame is the story of success, failure, the dream of spinning off into a TV series and a remake, not to mention <laughs> getting pissed off because you sensed there was a staying alive reference coming. But it ain't just about dancing, it's about acting and stand up. Kids are into sex a lot earlier in the South Bronx. Like about 6 a.m. <laughs> that joke offends me. Time to light your torches and stalk this man on Twitter. If some of these people practiced their moves harder, then perhaps they could have dodged Robocop and a tank of toxic waste. Alan Parker's fame is a dance classic, which comes in with energy that says, uh, let's just give Irene Cara the Oscar now for best song. It's only fair. And every dad at the time was thinking, Ugh, none of that gay dancing mumbo jumbo. Tom Horn is no longer in theaters, and I'm still craving something manly. Uh, yeah, so Walter Hill's The Long Riders will do. They were nine men. But unfortunately, they can't count as well as the Friday the 13th trailer. The Long Riders is the story of the James Younger Gang, which features the Carradines, the Quades, the Keeches. If you had a brother back then, you were in this movie. While Randy Quaid got a taste of hunting foxes, he decided to do so in the Old West, and David Carradine proves he is cooler than everyone's brother combined. While Billy the Kid and the Young Guns were off posing for Teen Beat, Chris and Nick Guest are gonna improvise away, all while horses are still escaping the sight of Heaven's Gate. The Long Riders, while awesome, wasn't a huge hit in the day, and I don't think it made much more money in the following weekend, because... Because holy shit, it's Star Wars 2, The Wrath of Wampas! This was back when it was fun to love Star Wars. Luke Skywalker and Han Solo rescued the princess, destroyed the Death Star, but their story didn't end there. That's right. It ended after episode six and nothing was made after. We're in safe hands, people. Now the creators of the biggest smash hit of all time. I had no clue it was from the creators of the smash hit The Ninth Configuration. Empire Strikes Back is beloved by all. Unless you write for a magazine called, Hey, look at me! Look at me! I said, look at me! Look at me! Hey, hey! Look at me! Although, if the internet were around back then, I could tell you how wrong it is. It's an epic of romance. See, that's all kinds of wrong and awkward. This better not ruin my space high. A galactic odyssey against oppression. Uh, keep your politics out of my Star Wars. Thank you very much. And you blew up the logo. God damn it, that was in mint condition. I hadn't even taken it out of its packaging. The Empire Strikes Back was the highest domestic and worldwide hit of 1980. That is, until... Gary Busey, Jodie Foster, Robbie Robertson, Carney. Until Carney came along and obviously dominated The Empire Strikes Back. In Carney, Jodie Foster runs away to escape the long fox hunters and joins a carnival with Gary Busey as a dunk tank clown? Oh, I know it sounds like a horror film, but it's not. It's a drama. Well, it sounds to me like you ought to be traveling with us. Again, not a horror movie. You're thinking of Funhouse. Carney was produced, co-written, and co-starring Robbie Robertson of the band. Just in case you were still a little high from where the buffalo roam and need a place to come down. Despite having only one other acting credit to his name, Robertson is pretty good in this film. As it's the timeless tale of chicks always ruining the carnival and coming between carnies, bros before bearded hoes. I see there's still some clown makeup here in this orange band trailer. Crazy Gary Busey as a carny wasn't crazy enough, so we need the Gong Show movie. It's gonna do much harm to the audience. The Gong Show movie was directed by Chuck Barris and was a fictional film about a shenanigans-filled week in the life of Barris. It 
it was the Jerry Springer ringmaster of its time. But with the main difference being, this one's pretty funny, despite featuring zero scenes of Barris assassinating people. That's how you know it's fiction. It's an underrated film that was so shit on upon release, even George Burns said it was so bad it made him want to get out of show business. Well, I can think of another 1980 comedy it was better than. I guess it was just too hot for TV. Or in theaters either, because it was pulled from screens after only three days. And just in time, because your pants are about to properly be shat in with the other May 23rd movie. Now this is a trailer. All you needed was Kubrick, Jack Nicholson, terrifying music, a Kubrickian shot of the elevator, not to mention... <laughs> Blood pouring out, indicating that we are watching Stephen King's The Lift. Uh, I mean, uh, The Shining, showing us what a real Red Band trailer is. Despite going on to become a horror classic, reviews were mixed at the time of release, with Stanley Kubrick even getting a Razzie nomination for Worst Director, proving that in their first year, the Razzies died an infant death. The trailer also tells you to read the book. That way you could talk endlessly about how wildly different the movie is. But give it 17 years and a lot of the book readers will still prefer the Kubrick one. With all this bloody madness, there has to be something for the kids. Ah yes, a recess movie! It's Charlie Brown and the whole Peanuts gang in another full-length feature cartoon called... Ooh, ooh, it's called It's a Lawsuit, Charlie Brown! Oh, right, the fourth in the quadrilogy of Peanuts films. It was the final Peanuts movie until the 2015 Blue Sky film, though it does have a direct sequel with the TV special What Have We Learned, Charlie Brown? We learned you had to go to France to beat the hell out of Peppermint Patty for ruining Thanksgiving. And to have dogs get drunk off of root beer and drive cars. And for us to understand what the adults are saying. What? This has ruined the lore of Peanuts. Although, thankfully, the no dogs rule from Snoopy Come Home still applies. The film wasn't a massive hit, obviously because the kids wanted to see some titties that weekend. 1980 even has a positive review Cinema Snob episode, despite the warning from Trailer Guy. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? The Gary Busey clown is jerking off in the men's room, isn't he? Hey, right. come on, will you? Give me a break. I'm on your side. Oh, they're just upset because the Gong Show movie was pulled. Unlike when time ran out, it makes sense for this trailer to have a smart-ass narrator. The problem is they won't let me show you any of the good stuff. And believe me, it's really good. That's because the Baltimore Bullet ruined it for everyone. You didn't need to wait till October to celebrate Halloween. You'll just have to guess why the heavyweight in the horn rims is having an attack. He accidentally stuffed cheeseburgers up his ass. Or why the cop was in the can and not on his beat. Get back, Bimbo! Also because of cheeseburgers. It's one of those trailers that tells us all about the things it can't show. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> take my sticky money. The Hollywood Nights is hysterically funny. Take it from me. Would I lie to you? I don't know. You told me to go see where the buffalo roam. It's okay if you miss one of my favorite movies, The Hollywood Nights, in theaters. You'll definitely be seeing it in frequent HBO airings. Now that I'm back and have had a proper shave and a shower, it's been too long in the year since Tom Horn came out. So we need a proper manly film that was an even bigger disappointment than Tom Horn. Charlton Heston, Brian Keith, about mountain men. Ooh, I hope it's about big, mountainous, greasy, man-bear action, since it already opened with tattoos on their asses. Yeah, I don't know, this seems like an awful lot of money was spent just to play cowboys and Indians. Engine! Engine! They snuck off on the... I heard the president watch this on repeat on Columbus Day. This looks like a whole movie based on that Robert Redford meme from Jeremiah Johnson. Don't worry, it's also got romance. They had their share of women. What, you gonna keep her? I go with you! You reckon I got any choice? 
never gonna pose for this romance novel shot whether you want to or not. The Mountain Men was very badly reviewed, from it receiving a bomb rating from Leonard Malton, and Siskel and Ebert both awarded it one of their Dogs of the Year. I miss these kinds of gimmicks. The film was written by Charlton Heston's son, Fraser Heston, who all claim the studio took such control over their much darker original cut that everyone was horrified by how the final cut was butchered. Jesus, was the original version straight up Custer's Revenge? This was 1980, though. If you were upset by a movie, just get yourself a hooker. A happy hooker, that is. There's at least one in Hollywood. Hey, wait a minute. I already talked about this movie in the 42nd Street Forever Part 3 episode. Now we're getting callbacks to my older trailer reviews? Eh, I might as well just relax for a little bit and show a clip from that review. Also, I don't need to hear Adam West saying bouncy bouncy, even if he is just talking about a ball. Oh, I miss my hair. Okay, so last week wasn't so great for movies with Steven Mocked. Maybe this week will be better with Galaxina. Once upon a time, that hasn't happened yet. Plus, the trailer guy is a smartass, so maybe it'll be when time ran out good. And steering the infinity among the heavenly bodies, the most heavenly body of them all, Galaxina. Check that, this trailer guy is way hornier. Hmm, I'm getting rip-off vibes here. Obviously a mockbuster of the classic film Star Crash. The film starred the late Dorothy Stratton as Galaxina. She can cook, supply you with internet references, and other things. <coughs> See? She'll even blow up your dick! It also features Captain 70s porn star, who has a fetish for banging the unknown comic. We've seen references to previous snob episodes, previous trailer episodes, and now posters featured on the Cinema Snob. Huh, perhaps I should have hung up this poster instead. Heaven's Gate premiered in 1980, but had its wider release in 81. I'm gonna have to fix that. Anyway, that was She-Ra. I mean, Galaxina. All right, while I'm hanging up the poster, read yourself a magazine, or watch a magazine movie at least. My magazine presents oh, the Academy. Well, temporarily it's from Mad Magazine. This is Up the Academy, the result of a contract with Warner Brothers and Mad Magazine to make their own animal house. The film performed so poorly with audiences and critics that Mad actually paid Warner to remove Mad references on video. Though the original version has since been put on DVD and shown on cable. Even Ron Liebman wanted his name removed from the credits. I can't imagine why! The movie seems mature. Social intercourse with members of the opposite sex. <clears throat> We may sleep in the same bunk and play around in the mud and shower together, but let's not be gay, bro! Everything is consensual here. Well, almost everything. Do you like it when a gentleman ties you up? What? You know, with rope. Stop kidnapping people, 1980! It's like Animal House if you folded its script pages to try to make another script. Come on, Mad Magazine. At least Mad Maker stuck with King Frat, largely because Mad Maker does not exist. The month of June is quite the softcore month. We've had softcore sex romps, and now we got a movie based on softcore country. Urban Cowboy is what happens when you spill a warm cup of Coors Light onto the script of Saturday Night Fever. How you doing? Fine. Anything I can do for you? Well, not yet. Also, it might be a gay bar. If you were disappointed that Travolta turned down an officer and a gentleman, really, you just kind of have to squint your eyes here a bit. That is, if he carried Deborah Winger out on a mechanical bull that snapped both of their spines. Oh, and spoiler! I sure hope this marriage works out. I'm not complaining against you, it's just certain things a man wants from his wife. Like to, like to be here when he gets home and then to, and to cook a meal once in a while. And then... Huh, I'm getting some serious Independence Day 83 vibes here. No, no, I have to wait until 1983 to break out the classic blowing up Clifty Young clip. 
After the 1978 bomb moment by moment, Urban Cowboy was seen as a brief career resurgence for Travolta, which hardly seems fair. Moment by moment wasn't his fault, and he still starred in the number one film of 1978. His career should have still been going strong despite Moment by Moment or the romance of Urban Cowboy. If you're the trailer guy from Up the Academy and thought Saturday Night Fever was too gay, this is for you. Ironically, a way more homoerotic movie. Did everyone just bang in these bars? There's been a lot of cowboys this month, so I'm sensing an Eastwood lurking around the corner. We welcome you this evening to the greatest Wild West show in America! Oh good, the Mountain Men live show. Bronco Billy is about a traveling show inspired by Buffalo Bills, and it's for people who are afraid that Carney might haunt their dreams a little too much. It's also a very self-referencing Eastwood film that pokes fun at his own image. Stick him up or I'll plug you. Are you really the fastest guy in the world? Ain't nobody faster than Bronco Billy. Judging from the rest of the trailer, he's gonna shoot those kids. Any more references? Uh, aren't you Bronco Billy the fastest in the West? I could outdraw you any day in the week. I can see why Eastwood called this his most affable film, between all the meta references and sound effects. Tell them we're gonna rob a train. Okay, Billy. <laughs> no, Scatman Crothers just got off the Silver Streak. This trailer does not want you to forget his name or the sound effects. Bronco Billy. I love you, Bronco Billy. I'm sorry, did he bang the horse afterwards? It's Eastwood, it's 1980, it's silly, it's a surefire box office hit. Good, Cowboys needed some rescuing at the box office this year. But if you're disappointed he didn't kill the children, B-movies have got you. It's time you believed in a new kind of horror, the horror of the children. Hey, wait a minute, I thought Dirty Harry already saved a bus of kids. Something you wouldn't dare to imagine has happened to the children. Ooh, they ended up at a Hollywood pool party. The Children, about kids turned into zombies, was released by Troma, so if it doesn't fill your dead kid fix, make it a double feature with Beware Children at Play. It's like a whole movie based on the Karen scene from Night of the Living Dead. Not gonna lie, the trailer does have some pretty great gritty and creeptacular vibes to it. And the trailer guy is coming in with big dogs energy. They're coming. They're coming your way. They'll be here soon. Will you be ready? Kids and dogs. We could make a horror movie out of anything at that time. It's like an undead version of Devil Times 5. So I'm getting five locks to lock my doors. Pray you'll never meet them. Fine, I'll get a vasectomy. But let's move on to a villain children love dressing up as pirates. Ah, the island. Sometimes you can tell, yep, based on a Peter Benchley novel. It's the story of modern day murderous pirates and chucking your camera out an airplane door. A savage race that vanished hundreds of years ago. But what if there were survivors? Look, it's the hills have eyes meets the fog. Just go along with it. This is the closest we've ever come to Michael Caine starring in a big-budget cannibal holocaust, still with evil kids. How dare you speak to your father like that? You're not my father. Stop this, make believe. See? They warned you to stay away from the children. The island is here to thrill the hell out of you Jaws style. Only replace the sharks with a boatload of pirates. And explosions. Way more explosions! Even though we're still in June, it's never too late to start planning a musical march in September. Rhodey, starring Meatloaf as Travis W. Redfin. Hmm, I'm listening. This is Rhodey, a story of truckers and roadies, and I just feel like it's gonna be co-starring a sentient beer gut. Starring Meatloaf, Art Carney, Khaki Hunter. The beer gut decided to take its name off of the credits. It had Ron Liebman's agent. The movie was directed by Robert Altman protege Alan Rudolph and co-written by softcore maestro Zalman King. That's about as random as its music lineup, which includes Hank Williams Jr. and... But I love Outlaws. Blondie. 
Blondie, of course! The Bama Band and Blondie, practically the same thing. Even Alice Cooper is there. It's gonna have Sergeant Pepper quality jokes. Alice Cooper, uh, she's one of Charlie's Angels. Too bad he is still in prison over that joke. Somehow it doesn't surprise me this movie is co-written by world-famous fast food mascot Big Boy. Did Rhodey not have enough cameos for you? Luckily, we've got the biblical spoof Holy Moses, starring Dudley Moore as Herschel, whose life mirrors Moses, because they both floated down the same river. I'm not taking you to Life of Brian. Who needs Life of Brian? I can make you Life of Brian at home. If it feels like a long sketch, well, it was directed by Saturday Night Live writer Gary Weiss. And sometimes you can just instantly tell when a movie is going to be co-starring Dom DeLuise, Madeline Kahn, and have a Richard Pryor cameo. The man was phenomenal! What, are you kidding me? He split the Red Sea in half! I mean, zip! Why make the rest of the movie? Just have Richard Pryor doing that for 90 minutes, and you'll have comedy gold! It also features John Ritter in the leftover costume department from Hero at Large. This movie promises big things, literally. Inspiration. Magnificent. Yeah, the reviews were terrible, but uh, after year one, uh, maybe Holy Moses wasn't that bad. We're branching out to even more shows that have been featured on this channel. So long, Cinema Snob. Let's look at something that was a DVD-R Hell episode. Animal Olympics from director Steven Lisberger was supposed to be an NBC premiere, but then had its runtime extended for an overseas theatrical release, but it couldn't find a U.S. distributor, so Warner gave it a home video release with premieres on an NBC affiliate station with the theatrical version airing on HBO. Look, we needed this movie after backing out of the Moscow Olympics. Golden Girl and Animal Olympics is all we had. Although it might be just a little bit fetishy. Lord, were all troubled productions dumped in June? Next, we have a production so troubled, it's literally called Rough Cut. Hell, I couldn't even find a trailer for this movie, which is weird considering it wasn't a bomb. It didn't make as much as a Burt movie would usually make around that time, but it still turned in a profit. Based on the book Touch the Lion's Paw by Derek Lambert, seven writers at one point worked on this adaptation. With such a terrible relationship between director Don Siegel and producer David Merrick that Siegel would be fired and then rehired through production. Even the novelist Larry Gelbart was fired as screenwriter by the original director Blake Edwards, who himself left the project. Again, Burt, being an admirer of the book, got Gelbart rehired. Since I don't have a trailer, I'm sure I got a good Burt clip around here somewhere. Just think of the charge you'll get when you steal $30 million worth of diamonds. Must sleep with Burt Reynolds. All right, enough messing around with forgotten films and lackluster musicals. We need ourselves a classic, and we need it now. Joliet, Jake, and Elwood Blues. Our neighbors. Oh, wait, I messed up again. Not only is the Blues Brothers one of the top ten highest grossing domestic releases of the year, but was one of the top five worldwide releases. The film marks the first movie version of SNL characters after they passed on a Bel Arabs movie, of course. This movie was here to fill the void of there being no James Bond movie or no Omen movies in 1980. The film really adds insult to injury by putting all the cameos in Rhodey and Holy Moses to shame. It's so 1980 that in one movie, it's got some of the best laughs you've seen, the best music you've heard, and some of the biggest car chases in a year that featured two Burt Reynolds movies. It's such an epic comedy that really makes me miss epic comedies. It's so stuffed with greatness that the average movie trailer in 1980 was about two minutes, but this one crams in four and a half minutes of greatness. Plus, people need to know that this is just how we drive through Chicago, especially when the global McDonald's brought back the teriyaki burger. The movie is hands down the best Chicago movie, and if you love the city, you'll want to pause to admire various locations, like, is Picasso's Untitled a wolf? Is it an Afghan hound dog? Is it General Grievous? Damn you, Picasso, you genius! Also, the movie is starring everyone. Everyone is in this movie. 
Dead! See? Even the explosions from the island are in it. But there couldn't be one great musical on the weekend of June 20th. No, no, we also needed to include a bad one. You can't stop the music! The new musical Sounds of the 80s are composed and produced by Chuck Morelli. Unfortunately, that's about all I can show from the movie Can't Stop the Music. There's a reason that snob episode isn't on the YouTube channel. But you can see it along with plenty of other non-YouTube uploads on our archive site, thecinemasnob.com. However, I can show a little bit of the bros from that review. You bring the beer? Oh, you know I brought the beer, bro! Good, bro, because I brought the guts! Hi yeah! I can't imagine why YouTube does not allow me to show hardcore bro-on-bro -bro action. Let's get more serious, though. As in Robert Redford as the warden of a troubled prison serious. Wakefield is admittedly an imperfect institution. Much like America herself. Does it have to look like a Nazi exploitation movie? With a name like Brubaker, it makes one ask, is that one of them John Wayne cop movies? No, you fools, he's Harry Brubaker, making the prison safe for when Robert Redford becomes an inmate in The Last Castle. It's a movie about how we must all be treated with dignity. Do not come marching in here from wherever the hell she found you and presume to lecture us about how to treat our fellow man. He wants to shove his nightstick up a prisoner's ass. It's his God-given right to do so. This looks like a total audience movie. You know how I can tell? It's crazy. They're, they're digging up bodies. Because it looks like an entire movie made out of slow claps. And you'd think the prison scandal movie would be the one this month to have a red band trailer? Here comes a brand new Herbie. It's dynamite. But nope, Herbie the love bug. What, does he bang another car in it? This is Herbie Goes Bananas, and by that I mean literally a car of bananas and other shenanigans. The love bug goes south of the border, the hard way. Is he thrown off the boat by the pirates from the island? Huh, I don't see Dean Jones anywhere in this trailer. No Dean Jones, no interest from me. Herbie Goes Bananas is considered the weakest of the franchise, which is it? Is it really? I'm sure this one has its moments. All new performance. Running circles around the competition. See? He fights a bull. <laughs> what? Despite the lack of Dean Jones, the cast isn't bad. Cloris Leachman. I think he wants to tell us something. It's a car woman, not Lassie. Harvey Corman. They all signed up because they were depressed for not being asked to be in Holy Moses. Joke's on them. You know a movie's gonna be good when the trailer tells you it's sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks. This looks like if the Baby Huey movie were about a car instead. I do not accept your apology. Possessed cars are an affront to God, so we need some spirit in our ass. Hop on board the last flight of Noah's Ark. They used it to search for the historic Jesus, led by Captain Elliot Gould. Say hello to Noah Dugan. Professional pilot. No thanks, I'd rather punch him in the stomach. Between this and Herbie, Disney is finishing out June all on their own. This is like Flight of the Phoenix meets the Bible, as a family is stranded with animals and they need to make a boat to get them off of this cursed island. Oh wait, that's it. It's the Bible meets Swiss Family Robinson meets the island. Luckily for them, they're on an island with a big movie budget, so they can build any giant prop they want. Just look at this cast. Elliot Gould, jean vierre Bougeau, Ricky Schroeder. See, even the cast was born with silver spoons. The movie only got mixed reviews and wasn't a colossal hit, but not for lack of trying. Incredible drama and adventure, as only the Disney cameras can bring to the screen. But I don't know, I'm sure Raise the Titanic will give it a shot, but that's later on in the summer. We gotta get to July first! Now that we're in July, there's no reason to release another comedy this summer because we're still stuffed with laughter from last month's Herbie Goes Bananas. Airplane. Well, okay, I guess the Zucker Abrams Zucker classic Airplane will do. This is a movie that preys on everyone's flying fears. 
Stand by. See, this is why I don't fly. Planes are also sharks. Highly regarded as one of the best comedies of all time, it's easy to see why. Look at all the famous quotes. There's a passenger on your Chicago flight 209 or a little girl named Lisa Davis en route to Minneapolis. <laughs> no one goes to Minneapolis. The movie is a comedy remake of Zero Hour, plus a gigantic satire of the airport series, and from here to eternity, of course, plus... Stay the night, stay the night. Ah uh, yes, John Travolto de un insolito destino. But let's get to some real classic quotes of the film. Peter Graves. You ever seen a grown man naked? Aw oh, sure, but when I quote that in public, I get a free ticket to Blue Lagoon later this month. It's a movie that shows that you can be so funny while playing it completely straight like you're in a drama. It's back when parodies were hilarious and PG movies had nudity in them. It's that glorious time when you could watch a comedy without a giant stick up your ass. Plus, there's so many Jaws references in the trailer that I kinda wanna watch Jaws now. No, no one will forget it. Alligator. I said Jaws, not alligator. But while I'm here, how dangerous is this alligator? It's 36 feet long. It weighs over 2,000 pounds. Huh, I didn't know John Holmes also had a movie coming out this month. Set in Chicago, the Blues Brothers warned us about Illinois Nazis, but said nothing about Illinois alligators. Yes, I said alligators. You kept coming up with some garbage about alligators in the sewers. Alligators in the sewers? Well, so much for my chud research. I'm just gonna throw this out there. Way better effects than Brutes and Savages. The makers of Alligator would know to throw some dirt into the pool. Wow, this gator seems really hard to find. There he is! Oh good, they got him. All the beer in the world won't prepare you for standing up to this gator. The movie turned in enough of a profit that it even had a tie-in tabletop game, plus a 1991 direct-to-video sequel that had nothing to do with the first one. Between 80% of the movies this summer, I'm getting the sense that water is dangerous, and judging by the next movie, it's also awkward. A wooden ship. Fire! A fire at sea. Up you go! Goddamn pirates, stop going out to sea or you'll end up on the island. Yet the boy and the girl grew strong and tall and beautiful. Oh wait, this is the Blue Lagoon, a.k.a. Gilligan's Jailbait Island. It's the story of what happens when two stranded young people go through puberty alone on an island. It was critically panned, but was a colossal hit and part of the bizarre let's watch Brooke Shields turn into a woman genre. Though this one is more cannibal feroxy. What? I already used the cannibal holocaust reference on the island trailer. The one mystery lay on the forbidden side of the island. Dark. Sinister. Oh god, what else is horrible about this island? The other mystery was hidden deeper still. The other side is horrible too. They were stranded with no dirty magazines. The hell is this movie? She sees that his shoulders are wide. She senses there is one secret here she doesn't know. I'm sorry, is it the trailer guy that wants to bang him? Never before could I just sense that the trailer guy is jerking off in his booth. In case you weren't in jail yet for indecent exposure, there was a sequel, Return to the Blue Lagoon, where the two leads here are dead on their boat. <laughs> this movie exists for nothing. Just saying, it would be much better if they were dogs. I want some hands. Oh! oh, heavenly dog. Okay, maybe not much better, but more Twilight Zony. Chevy Chase is Benjamin Browning, a struggling private eye. Mm, this was the Twilight Zone when it was suggested that Rod take a nap for a while. I always forget just how gloomy this movie is. The good news is... Call me on Friday. He's going to make a date. Call you Friday. What's the bad news? That he gets turned into a dog? The bad news is he's going to be late. Oh, it's that he's late and dead. Don't worry, Chevy, you just have a few weeks to kill before Caddyshack comes out. As for now, though, you're Benji the dog. A pair of hands. With 48 wild and woolly hours to solve his own murder. 
still would rather watch this than The Blue Lagoon. Sure, you could just watch the Cinema Snob episode, but don't forget the Lloyd Animated Series episode, which is the world's only Oh Heavenly Dog parody. It's also not as awkward. In an adult tale of murder and forbidden love. I don't like being cute. I don't like being fluffy. Was every movie this month a sting operation by the police? At least it kept Roald Dahl's original ending where he stays a dog. You know, some of these comedies are bringing back bad memories. I wish they would put some kind of warning on these trailers. At last, a controversial new motion picture that dares to deal with a serious contemporary problem. Oh god, it's gonna have a man with an ass on his stomach like in Caligula, isn't it? Oh, thank God it's used cars. We needed a good comedy after Oh Heavenly Dog. And we also need a reminder of great Robert Zemeckis after The Witches. The film was executive produced by Spielberg and John Milius, but wasn't a box office hit, though did gain a cult following over time. Why would this movie lie? Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Yes, trust me, used cars is awesome, and even has an estimated laugh count on the poster. That's a surefire laugh guarantee. Not even the private eyes had that, or the next movie. And by that, I mean literally next movie, as in Cheech and Chong's next movie, their follow-up to Up in Smoke. In the tradition of the great comedy teams, war and pestilence, bad breath, <laughs> and body odor. At this point, if it's got burping and body odor and fart humor in the trailer, I'm assuming Don Pardo is going to narrate it. This is like they got baked and snook onto the set from King Frat. The movie wasn't a critical success. Shock. The film that leaves a stain on the theater screen. The dirty and filthy and deceit! See? Doesn't even sound like Trailer Guy liked it. But it was, however, a big box office hit. Is it a love story? Is it a musical? Treat me like food. What? It doesn't even know what genre it is. Be more confident like Airplane. That movie knew that it was every genre. Is it a foreign film? I think they're Iranian. Well, great. Now if I trash the movie, it's just going to respond with, I know you are, but what am I? What? Aliens? I have the sneaking suspicion they were making this up as they went along. Oh, also, they needed an explosives budget to light whatever skyscraper-sized joint they smoked to make this movie. Another impossible-to-find trailer is for the movie Honeysuckle Rose. That sounds like a retitled mockbuster that would sit alongside Country Music Daughter. The movie stars Willie Nelson, who balances music, family, and an extremely bad high after watching Next Movie. The film is a loose remake of Intermezzo. <laughs> okay, so they are high. It was actually a decent hit, though. Now known mainly for Willie's song On the Road Again, which had an Oscar nomination for Best Song. Amy Irving, however, won the Razzie for Worst Supporting Actress, which at this point we've learned that if you're nominated for a Razzie, that's a compliment. Even the next film is completely trailerless. What a summer at the movies! By just looking at the cover for The Little Dragons, I'm getting a hunch that this was not a box office hit. The film had a 1980 release, but as some viewers have pointed out, the stars, the Peterson brothers, appear much younger than in some of their other 1980 appearances. So the movie was likely made around 77 or 78. What? This was a holdover? Say it ain't so. Hell, it didn't even stay titled The Little Dragons. When it had a 1991 VHS release, it was called Karate Kids USA, complete with a tagline that said, Before the karate kid, there was Karate Kids. It should have said from the director of L.A. Confidential. Or how about the 1984 release, subtitled Karate Kids to the Rescue. Or later on with Meet the Real Karate Kids. You've convinced me. I should watch the Karate Kid instead. Oh good, another Red Band trailer. What machinery is Herbie gonna have sex with this time? Ah, a disco ball. Didn't see that coming. Night to be beautiful. To be desirable. A night we can break all the rules. Yes, finally, the big budget remake of Jennifer that we all needed. This is Prom Night, the movie that shows that there are worse things that could happen on Prom Night than premature ejaculation. Nick? Wendy, do you still? 
told you months ago, don't answer the phone. Why won't anyone listen to me? Prom Night is a 1980 slasher movie that has everything you need in a 1980 slasher film. Jamie Lee Curtis, disco dancing, and dead teenagers. Prom Night. If you're not back by midnight, you won't be coming home. Because your parents will make you sleep on the lawn, and the following day you will be so grounded. Now you'd think you'd be getting more horror in the following movie, given it's called The Earthling, but nope. It's just the birth of America's Funniest Home Videos Camping Edition. Can't hold it! Ah! Ooh, can't wait till it lands! Pfft, whatever. Cheech and Chong would have shown that explosion. The movie is about William Holden and Ricky Schroeder surviving in the forest after Ricky's flight on Noah's Ark totally crashed. It's the life lesson of teach a Ricky Schroeder to fish. That's how I outsmart all those wonderful creatures. Or maybe just give them a granola bar. I'm sure you have one in your pocket. This movie looks like high adventure. My clothes stink. Wash them. Mm, amazing learning to do laundry action. But I'm sure there's other life lessons too. William Holden finds his life's meaning in a selfless act of love. <laughs> the love for watching dogs chase the hell out of that kid. Plus... I love you. I never told my father that. A man's love for using a kid as a therapist? The hell is with this guy? The man would never leave. The boy would never come back. The Earthling. Why does this movie feel creepy? And why is it called The Earthling? Someone get me a comedy fast! Phew, Caddyshack. Coincidentally, after Oh, a Heavenly Dog, Chevy also screamed, Someone get me a comedy fast! Starring Chevy Chase as Ty Webb, a sportsman who really knows how to score. Plus, the trailer guy is jerking off to a good movie for once. This is a collection of some of the funniest people who ever lived in one of our most beloved comedies. It's a movie that tossed much of the script aside and let the actors just do their thing, but they actually made that work. Yeah, structurally, the movie's all over the place, but with Harold Ramis directing, it knows when to pull back and when to not let something ramble or go on too long. And it makes every scene contain the right amount of laughs with its great cast. He's not crazy about gophers, <laughs> but he is crazy. Bill is still working off that acid from where the buffalo roam. Who doesn't pull back, though? The trailer guy. Caddyshack. It's all about swinging. Kiss me, you fool. But not on the course. Someone needs to cut him off. I think he's got a whole book of these innuendos. Controlling your drives. Wow! And losing your grip. That's the 50th one he's used in the trailer. This was back in the day when the most explosions were in comedies and not action films. There's almost as many explosions as there are puns. Caddyshack. The comedy with... I believe you wanted to say balls. What are you, shy now? On the last weekend of July, if you wanted a great comedy, you got it. And if you want a great thriller, you got that too with Dress to Kill. Would you want to sleep with me? Yeah. Then why don't you? Because I love my wife. Also, I was stuck on an island for months and I'm not over the killer pirates yet. Brian De Palma is a master at showing you if you want to do Hitchcock, don't just remake it. Give it your own voice so much that its style is more unique to De Palma than it is Hitchcock. De Palma is like an American giallo master, and Dress to Kill should be just as highly regarded as Dario Argento classics like Deep Red. The direction is perfect. Michael Caine and Angie Dickinson are great. So of course the movie had three Razzie nominations. Never mind Caddyshack and Airplane, the Razzies had the biggest jokes of 1980. This is an erotic thriller with teeth. Even if you do see the twist coming, it's still a stylish treat. Dressed to kill. Murder made to order. Though if it's anything like Grubhub, the delivery fee will be a bitch. Now let's get in some sci-fi for the month, as the final countdown is going to take us back in time to when we had to land planes without power gloves. You are on board the USS Nimitz. 
if that's where I'm at, then that means I'm way lost! This is like if Rod Serling sobered up after Oh Heavenly Dog and gave us a good Twilight Zone. The movie's about what happens when an aircraft carrier is teleported 40 years into the past, right before Pearl Harbor, and has to decide on whether or not to intervene. Sadly, this was before the Europe song could be used as the theme, but it's still got a great cast. I'm speaking to every man aboard this ship. The storm is... Whoa, whoa, whoa! I didn't even get to Don't Panic yet! The movie also features the President of the United States, as well as my dad, who is also an associate producer on the film. He definitely has stories about this one. The movie was a moderate success and had such an eye-catching plot and cast that eventually it was given the respectable two-disc DVD treatment. So the budget in the cast doesn't go to waste. <laughs> What? Explosions? This isn't a comedy. Oh, and the death scenes are pretty great, too. You're an expert on what's gonna happen tomorrow. Why don't you tell him about it, for God's sakes? Go on, tell him! We got nothing to lose! So, did they tell him or not? We've had some jokes this year about Tom Horn, but 1980 also contains the release of the Steve McQueen movie The Hunter, which thankfully was a box office hit since it was McQueen's last film before his death that November. And this trailer is gloriously McQueen. Steve McQueen is level-headed. No thanks to smart-ass trailer guy again. He's not as fast as he used to be. I dare you to say that to McQueen's face. But he is the hunter. Okay, that sold me. I definitely would have bought a ticket to this film. The movie is inspired by real-life bounty hunter Ralph Papa Thorson, and I can see why it was a hit, and why it was the movie that McQueen needed at that time. It has action, the McQueen charm, and car chases, one involving a tractor. It's going along with my theory that it was McQueen who created crop circles. Plus, we get to see Steve McQueen being just plain cool. Okay, it's got a full clip. Bang, 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 bang. Okay. The movie's not one of his best, but it still has that Steve McQueen we grew up with. And it does shit like this with no CGI. One way or another. Oh no, now Ricky Schroeder will be stranded again. Also, I think Scorpio might be the bad guy. Now here's something for the kids before they go back to school. Remember the Pogo comic strip? Did you know there was a movie version of it? Ooh, Steve McQueen! Oh right, Pogo. Sorry. The movie features Jonathan Winters, Vincent Price, and New York Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin. The kids love Jimmy Breslin! Anyway, is this trailer gonna show me anything else or not? The trailer is just the opening credits, isn't it? The movie, like the comic strip, features comedy for kids and adults along with political satire. 1980 is an election year. Election madness, with every fool and his frog wanting Pogo Possum for president. Ugh, why do political cartoons have to be so political? Plus, if you get high beforehand, you won't even know it's stop-motion animation. I, uh... I forgot what the saying. Yeah, forget it. You're not gonna out-high Cheech and Chong. Nor do I think you're gonna out-high Loose Shoes, a Kentucky Fried movie like sketch film made up of fake trailers. They came empty-handed, but left with a fistful. <coughs> Invasion of the Penis Snatchers! What? So this movie was kinda to Bill Murray what can I do it till I need glasses was to Robin Williams, in that it was made years prior and only released to capitalize on the newfound fame of a cast member. Plus, it's here to say, hey, where the Buffalo Rome is no longer the worst 1980 Bill Murray movie. It does have plenty of other names in it, too, like Howard Hessman, Buddy Hackett, and Avery Schreiber, still confused because he thought Galaxina was the fake trailer. But it is based on classic source material. Based on a joke told by Earl Butts. I push in shoes in a long place to ship. See? Why didn't they say that before? I bet this film is a real masterpiece! Dig it. Good shit. I 
Fuck off, folks! Never mind, this movie is rude. At least the Herbie trailer apologized to me. This one told me to F off! I want to speak to this movie's manager. Let's go back to the last flight of Noah's Ark for a minute, because if there was any money left over to burn from that film, don't worry, Raise the Titanic has got you covered. This notorious flop only made $7 million against a $40 million budget. Now that may have been something until Heaven's Gate came along to say, hold my $40 million beer. Based on the book by Clive Cussler, the movie about the search for the Titanic had it all wrong. It needed an old lady there to tell him about the time she banged in a car. And if you forget the title, it's got you covered. Are you talking about raising the Titanic? No, I'm talking about loosening our shoes. Yes, this is Raise the Titanic. They do run into some trouble along the way, though. For instance, they have to face off against the Thing. This is why James Cameron was smart enough to make The Abyss and Titanic two separate movies. The movie features Richard Jordan in the role of Dirk Pitt, a role that would later be played by Matthew McConaughey, in the adaptation of Clive Cussler's other novel, Sahara, which went on to lose even more money than this film did. Perhaps if the trailer had the smart ass from the When Time Ran Out trailer, it could have lost more money. Critics at the time said it would have been cheaper to lower the Atlantic, which is all wrong. They should have said it would have been much cheaper to actually raise the Titanic. I think I know why it bombed. It shows the raising of the Titanic in the trailer. You've already shown me the money shot. Anyway, remember being there, the critically acclaimed Peter Sellers film, which got Sellers a nomination for Best Actor? Well, if that was his uncut gems, meet his Hubie Halloween. Happy birthday, Hubie. Happy birthday, Hubie. The fiendish plot of Dr. Fu Manchu is not as good as being there, no matter what the trailer says. One hour after seeing the fiendish plot of Dr. Fu Manchu, Excellent. you'll want to see it again. Well, they just lost millions of dollars to a false advertising lawsuit. While The Hunter was a nice success for Steve McQueen before his death, this was Peter Sellers' last completed film, and it was not a success. In fact, it made the Christopher Lee Fu Manchu movies seem far more dignified, but not as far out. The Far East has never been so far out. That's because Tommy Chong hadn't made Far Out Man yet. And why would I want to see a Hugh Hefner-produced movie rated PG? This is the movie version of reading the articles. Oh, wait, uh, never mind. It might still have nudity. You don't need me to tell you it's getting near the end of summer. I can feel it by all these box office disappointment dumps. The most dazzling romantic musical fantasy in years. Xanadu. And I don't care because I love Xanadu, and I am glad to be living in a time that has other people who also love Xanadu. And given that the other roller disco movie of the year was Can't Stop the Music, of course this is the superior film! It's a love letter to both modern musicals and old Hollywood musicals, as it's starring Olivia Newton-John and Gene Kelly, also Michael Beck, though if you love The Warriors, I'm not sure that automatically means you'll love Xanadu. The trailer is tripped out like it's a show put on inside the Zardoz Tabernacle. Good thing it tells us the genre. It's a love story about a boy and girl from two very different worlds. And you won't go to prison, unlike if you buy a ticket to the Blue Lagoon. The movie is joyful musical filmmaking. It's bright and colorful, and my kind of musical. The kind that's pitched to producers after burying your face in Tony Montana's Cocaine Mountain. I ask again, would I lie to you? No, seriously, the next movie is called Would I Lie to You? <laughs> I gotta stop doing that. In it, Treat Williams stars as a compulsive liar named Cletus. That's his first lie. No one is named Cletus. It's a romantic comedy between Cletus and a social worker, and also features a young Gabriel Mocked, so it's also a spirit origin story. The movie wasn't a big hit, and looking at the poster, I can imagine the trailer guy just wanted to stay home and jerk off to the erotic adventures of Pinocchio instead. Critics at the time didn't care for it either, as Janet Maslin said, it takes three quarters to figure out where it's going. I guess it was the Bly Manor of its time. 
However, this movie knows where it's going, and by that, I mean it knows a fist is going into your face. No one will admit they still exist. What, 3D movies? The Octagon stars Chuck Norris versus ninjas. But what about the Master Ninja? Never mind that. The Octagon is your wish come true. If you wanted the Richard Harrison segments of the Godfrey Ho movies to be full films. It's hard to tell what's going on here, but I know it's definitely Chuck Norris kicking someone's ass. Now we're definitely in the 80s, because there will be a lot more of Chuck Norris kicking people's ass throughout the decade. And ask and you shall receive, because here is the Master Ninja! If you saw ninjas... You're seeing ghosts. I hope to God Lee Van Cleef's appearance here settles it that this is the Master Ninja universe. Who cares about the plot? He's fighting ninjas for freedom! You will find freedom only one way. By taking geometry class? Doesn't matter what the shapes are, by the end of it, everything is just gonna be a big pile of rubble. No one will admit they still exist. That's where you're wrong. The internet loves to remind you that Chuck Norris movies still exist. I am, however, slightly concerned by the threat of kidnappings here, after I warned 1980 to stop kidnapping people in Up the Academy. But now we have the kidnapping of the president? No, that's the opposite of what I said. You've kidnapped the president? That's too far! This Canadian-American thriller was made after Shatner's Star Trek The Motion Picture comeback, which explains its bigger budget and less TV movie quality. And it's based on a best-selling novel about the fight to rescue President Al Halbrook handcuffed in a truck with a bomb. It's largely forgotten, but it's a good little hidden thriller, which awesomely features Shatner telling someone, If you fuck with me, I'll rip your heart out. So Shatner got a comeback, McQueen got a comeback, and after Rough Cut, Burt needs a little bit of a boost. So here's Smokey and the Bandit 2, a much more financially successful film, though I'd argue Rough Cut was the better movie. The opening wants you to think back so hard on the original classic that even the thumbnail is from the first movie. And seriously, it definitely wants to remind you of the first one. I'm sure you all recall how I went after a fella by the CB name of Bandit. Yes, I do recall that. I love the first movie. Can't I just watch that one? Though maybe the movie will still be unpredictable. There ain't no way he's gonna make a fool out of Buford T. Justice this time. I bet you in the movie, he makes a fool out of Buford T. Justice. The sequel has a heavier emphasis on driving stunts than comedy. Oh wait, I'm wrong. <laughs> that elephant trunk is like his dick. Despite not getting as good of reviews as the first one, it was still one of the ten highest grossing movies of the year. Why not? Look, they wreck a roller coaster. And if Jackie Gleason was your favorite part of the first one, we've cloned him here. Jackie Gleason, Jackie Gleason, Jackie Gleason. Not to mention it has the kind of car chase stunts that would later be reserved for a George Miller film. At least this sequel has scope, which is more than I can say about Smokey and the Bandit 3. And yes, it's still a horny trailer. It's not what's in your trunk that counts. It's who's on your tail. Well, the trailer guy's in luck, because the title of the next movie is the horniest title of the year. Those lips, those eyes. The film features Tom Hulse, Glynis O'Connor, and a singing Frank Langella. But never mind the singing. Harry, did you get my note? Yeah, I got your note. It's right here. Give me a kiss. Maybe later, kid. I'm desperate. Because he is banging those dancers backstage. This was the last movie of August. It was a movie that brought all of the nation's kids together to say, oh, maybe we are ready to go back to school. Oh, but why? Only the best movies come out on Labor Day weekend, or September in general. Just wait and see. We would like to take this opportunity to thank you for not talking during the film. They say that the year's worst movies always come out in either January or Labor Day weekend, but clearly that is not true in 1980, because we are starting out September with Empire Strikes Back on a discount! Let's take a look at this battle beyond the stars. You know, those are still better special effects than if this movie were made today. 
Produced by Roger Corman, the movie is sold as The Magnificent Seven in Space. What a space western, what a ridiculous concept, but kudos for the villain. Oh, who didn't expect John Saxon to someday take over the universe? And much like Empire Strikes Back, it also has awkward kisses. Does your species have kissing? Oh, yes. We also have plugs for your ass. Now bend over. At least we know space dad jokes exist. That's a hot dog. It comes from Earth. Do you like it? There's no dog in this. Mm -mm. It's like Battlefield Earth reenacted by the aliens from Galaxy Quest. But you get more bang for your buck here than Star Trek Discovery. And I mean literal bang. They are lighting these firecrackers. Word of warning, if you are suffering from a phobia, the next movie may be for you. This is John Huston's phobia, though I don't see planes anywhere, so should I be safe to watch this? What phobias are included? And they are about to become the victims of a killer. Not <laughs> jokes on you, I find that hilarious! The film is about a doctor who cures people of phobias, and then they start dying. Maybe because he didn't have his trusty hutch by his side? Critic Kevin Thomas called it the worst film ever directed by a winner of the American Film Institute's Life Achievement Award. Please, you should be more specific! But with Houston directing, it is still stylish. Ooh, I can't wait for Saw Part Zero. Though we're still in September, we are getting closer to award season. Can't you tell? The next film has Tom Hanks in it. This is gonna be stellar. On the night before her wedding, every girl is alone. Um, she is? How's she getting married if she has zero friends? Not only does he know you're alone, but also every other girl as well. Nancy. Amy. Tricia. Sybil, however, definitely not alone. Now here's more facts about weddings. On the night before her wedding, every girl is frightened. I question the trailer guy's experiences with weddings. What kind of assholes are his friends marrying? They must be leaving Tom Hanks as a surprise. He knows you're alone, and it's going to be for the very last time. Unless you get divorced, then he may come back for your second wedding. Now here's a question you should ask after your wedding. You want the sheets? If it's a good honeymoon, you're gonna want the sheets. I feel like I just watched this movie, but here's a reminder. In war, you have to kill to survive. On the streets of New York, the choice is the same. However, at least in war, you have yourself a badass CCR soundtrack. But here, there's significantly more chaining up gang members, shooting people in a getaway car, and lowering mob bosses into a meat grinder. All the Lord's work! The police are chasing a killer. He's doing their job. I don't know if it's such a good idea just going around shooting people. The Exterminator is still a sleaze-fest classic, though. Great for fans of vigilante movies, and yada yada, I talked about this already this year. I'm just glad the trailer includes possibly one of the greatest opening shots of all time. Enough joking about Oscar contenders, let's get to a real Academy Award winner here, Melvin and Howard. I'm Howard Hughes. Yeah, sure, you also raised the Titanic. The trailer definitely wants you to know Melvin's having a bad week. His pickup truck was repossessed. You may be having a bad time, but that reaction was priceless. But how bad can your week be when you're now a millionaire from Howard Hughes? Then Howard Hughes left him $156 million. Oh, it's because you were suffocated from the weight of all of that in quarters. This Jonathan Demi film won Mary Steenburgen an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress and is a better example of why would I lie? Do you swear in the name of God? That this story about how you received this will is true? Yes, the hoax was the other Howard Hughes story. And that's the tale of how two people got Jason Robards to take a shower and have some coffee. 
I've been going through a few different lists to make this video, and the longest and most extensive one is the one over on Wikipedia, but even that left out titles. For instance, it does not include Ordinary People, which would later go on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. Oh, but thank God, they remembered to include The Little Dragons! Poor Atlantic City was even left off of the April list! Maybe they were just pissed that Howard Hughes didn't bless those slot machines. Eh, wake me when it's the Windy City, so I can come in with my bags packed with Saul references. As for Ordinary People, it was Brubaker's directorial debut after saving the prison system, and it taught us a valuable life lesson. In this typical town, three ordinary people are about to live an extraordinary story. That star's hollow was lame before Lorelei had Rory! All joking aside, the film deals with a family torn apart by the death of one son and the attempted suicide of the other. It shows that there are great 80s melodramas and not just the ones used as the fourth pick on a snob poll. The acting here is incredible, and it led to Oscar nominations for TV legends like Judd Hirsch and Mary Tyler Moore, and won Oscars for Picture, Director, Screenplay, and a Supporting Actor Award for Timothy Hutton. So I take back everything I said about September. See, there's also 12 Academy Award nominations for Marty Feldman's In God We Trust. That would make more sense than the Razzies. I have a hunch this is gonna be awfully slapsticky. This is one of the few films to feature Andy Kaufman. His filmography confuses me. I'm supposed to trust God, but God is also telling me to kill? And I assume Andy Kaufman is in this. Peter Boyle, Louise Lasser, Richard Pryor, and Andy Kaufman. In God We Trust. Yes, even though we don't show you the actors, trust us. <laughs> Fat chance, I put my trust in Kurt Russell and used cars! You know, there's one thing we're missing from all of these 80s movies. So funny. Alright, 80s bullies! Chris Makepeace is having a hell of a time when he doesn't have Bill Murray to teach him about the ladies. Look at the terror these bullies are causing! Hey, Shelly, wanna go to the movies tonight? Sure. Yeah, you have a real good time while you're there, huh? Then from that moment on, she became a husband-killing serial killer. In my bodyguard, our heroes don't have enough money to pay Drillbit Taylor for protection, but they do get Adam Baldwin. Good, this is a way better movie than Drillbit Taylor. One of them was short. One of them was strange. Together, they were absolutely unbeatable. That's the tagline? Damn, I was gonna use that as the tagline for another cinema snob movie. That's the movie where Lloyd Kaufman plays my dad, by the way. And don't let the Oscar-winning melodrama Ordinary People fool you. We still got forgotten melodramas this month. In Resurrection, Ellen Burstyn has the power to heal other people after a car accident. It's like we have two Exorcist 2s. One follows Reagan, the other follows her mom, and neither are as good as The Exorcist. Between this and The Earthling, I am getting screwed by these movies that sound like horror films. Let's be fair, though. Director Daniel Petrie's biggest contribution to forgotten melodramas is the 1987 movie Square Dance. To say how to make a chicken casserole. Oh yeah? Mm. Wednesday at five will be fine. Oh yeah, that exists. But let's get to the better movies of awards season. For instance, we got a Woody Allen film on our plate. I don't want to make funny movies anymore. They can't force me to. Unfortunately, it's Stardust Memories, not one of Woody's best. It's a dramedy take on Fellini's Eight and a Half that's like a therapeutic film where he plays a director who recounts his career and his love life. These are themes better explored in Annie Hall, though Jessica Harper does make her 80th appearance on The Cinema Snob this year, and I miss Tony Roberts being in Woody movies. Here's the problem with the movie. By Earth standards, I have an IQ of 1600, and I can't even understand what you expected from that relationship with Dory. It's, uh, it's a little pretentious. We enjoy your films, particularly the early funny ones. However, it's still Woody, so it's still got some good lines. Maybe in the Cinema Snob Movie 3, I'll shoot it in black and white and ask the universe if I should re-review Friday the 13th Part 5. Then a talking refrigerator will answer me. 
Now here's something less pretentious, though I still have to search within myself to ask, did I? Did I review this trailer for Without Warning already? It looks familiar. I feel like I have. You know you've reviewed a lot of trailers. When I had to go to IMDb to see if I reviewed this, then when it wasn't listed, I still wasn't sold. So I found out, yes, yes I did review this trailer in Cooled by Refrigeration. How could I forget with these lines? And now, man is the endangered species. I should have known I already reviewed it when it set me up for another Battlefield Earth reference. Yes, we are in Halloween season now, so bring on the scary movies! Hi gang, Robert Blake here. No, 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 no! Too scary! This is coast to coast, and I don't know what this film is, but I don't think it'll live up to the trailer. It ain't nothing but a riot, so if you want to have a good time, <laughs> go see Coast to Coast. Did you have to get drunk to promote your own movie? Hell, the trailer even cuts him off! Go see Coast to Coast. Starts Rated right at Man Sports Arena, La Jolla Village. No one tells Robert Blake last call. Eh, moving on to something else eerie, what if the New York Ripper starred Frank Sinatra? In the city, there's a man loose who kills. I think by now we've learned that 60% of the population in 1980 roamed the streets to kill. This is a cop thriller starring Frank Sinatra and Faye Dunaway, which was Frank's last starring role, but it's part of a fantastic early 80s version of Where's Waldo called Spot the Bruce Willis. Oh, there he is! Boom! Bruce Willis! Anyway, remind me again. What's the first deadly sin? The first deadly sin. Ah, destroying artwork. Got it. Still, there is far too much sinning going on here, so you need the word of God in your ass. This is God speaking. Yeah, God. Weird. Doesn't sound like the John Wayne chimpanzee from Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, right. It's an Oh God sequel. Is it too late to say from the director of The Last Married Couple in America? The movie is called Oh God Book Two, and it'll have just as many laughs as the first one. Oh yeah, then why is the trailer just this shot of the clouds? I'm not saying that anybody who went to see God's first movie will fall out of favor if they don't see God's second movie. But why look for trouble? Well, this is the first movie I could think of where God just straight up threatens to kill you if you don't go see it. You sure this isn't starring the devil character from the third movie? There is another trailer that shows clips, though. So the first movie was about God using John Denver to help promote the Lord, and the second one has God using a young girl to help promote the Lord. So I guess the events in the first movie meant nothing. This is the same thing again, but as the trailer says... By the way, I just finished a new movie. That's right, I made another movie. You know me, I just can't stop creating. Uh, yeah, especially when the first movie was a big hit. Now let's move on to the title of my autobiography, One Trick Pony. The film is written by and starring Paul Simon as a rock star who's putting out a new album and struggling to save his marriage. So it's a less artsy Stardust Memories, got it. I wonder if the trailer editors started getting tired this late in the year, since a lot of these fall trailers are only about 30 seconds. One Trick Pony, a film from Warner Brothers. Opens Friday at the Uptown Theater in 35mm Dolby Stereo. Go see it, or not, what do we care? We're just the trailer. Thankfully, in Somewhere in Time, they go back to earlier in the year, so it's a longer trailer at two minutes. Or it could be that these are just TV trailers. In this film, Christopher Reeves searches for love using hypnosis to travel back in time to the year 1912 to find an actress that he's in love with. Seems complicated. All he has to do is just spin around the world to go back in time. You can still use romance novel dialogue. Richard! A haunting story of the link between a man and a woman. A link that goes beyond fantasy. It's also about how you're not going to have sex for the rest of the month unless you take your wife to this movie. Also, you owe her after you dragged her to that Jane Seymour romance with a dog. It is funny, though, that you could tell someone there's a 1980 film with such a devout following it has an official fan club and an annual convention. <laughs> no, not Empire. It's somewhere in time. Also, do I need to remind you that it's still October? Can we get a slasher movie, please? Terror Train. Thank you, Terror Train! Terror Train uses the clever concept of having its killer wear multiple masks throughout the movie, so they never know which one is the slasher villain. Fortunately, these Jamie Lee Curtis movies have ruined babysitting, ruined prom night, and now they're ruining train travel for me! I'm terrified of flying! I need the train! 
but like prom night, the day is saved with some disco, and it prepares Jamie for the train climax from Trading Places. Oh, looks like a lot of deaths here, but am I gonna get my money's worth? <coughs> yep, Scream Queen Jamie Lee screams, I got my money's worth. Okay, it's been a week. It's time to cash in that favor for taking your wife to somewhere in time. Luckily, Superman 2 is here to save the day, complete with a trailer that will also hold your hand. The adventure continues with the three villains from Krypton, each one with the same powers as Superman. Thanks, Cliff Notes trailer. I guess this looks exciting, but seriously, release the Donner Cut! Uh oh, uh, thanks. You may now continue blowing shit up. The world is on the brink of destruction. No, if only he had swung the world's nuclear weapons into the sun sooner! Superman 2 has iconic villains and great effects that still hold up. You don't have to sell me anymore! If you've only seen the first part, you haven't seen the best part. Yeah, okay, I fell for that when God told me the same thing about Oh God Book 2. You think you're more trustworthy than God? <laughs> Okay, okay, you sold me. It's better than God's movie. What's this? A gray band trailer? There must be excessive use of the Depression era. Oh, wait, never mind. It's the Elephant Man. At first, you will want to turn away from him. But then soon you'll want to bang him. Just kidding. Soon you'll want to continuously quote the movie and reference it in every other animated series. This true story of John Merrick is the perfect David Lynch movie to introduce your grandma to, and then when she loves it, let her watch the rest of his filmography. They do a great job of not showing much of Merrick in the trailer, but again, given Gilgood was just in Caligula, I'm still assuming someone is going to have sex with the Elephant Man on Capri. As we're getting even deeper into Oscar season, how about something for the foreign film category? My blockbuster sense is tingling! And my cinema snob sense is tingling! Never heard of it! Look, all you need to know is smart people like this movie. And this was before the internet, so you could have a classy trailer that says, This is awesome! Okay, okay, fine. Here's some clips from the film. Relax, years later you can throw Tom Cruise in there somewhere. Now all the 90s kids are looking at this film and saying, aren't the Ninja Turtles supposed to show up? Again, see it, because smart people liked it, but really, we've already learned a Kurosawa film will be better in outer space. From one Academy Award-nominated film to another, we have Private Benjamin, starring Goldie Hawn, which was one of the biggest hits of 1980. For her wedding, she is getting a hilarious comedy and a wake-up call. Uh, I did join the army, but I joined a different army. Uh, I joined the one with the condos and the private rooms. Damn, Rowan and Martin's practical jokes were harsh back in the day. Eh, so you join the army by mistake. It happens to the best of us. Between this and Overboard, this was the era of let's throw some mud on Goldie Hawn and make her clean shit. Also, I feel like this shot is in most Woody Allen movies in the 70s, but I'm glad it's in this movie, since this movie is way better than Stardust Memories. This isn't even a Woody Allen movie. However, Ants is an excellent Woody Allen Private Benjamin film. But we still need a horror movie, and we got a great one. This is Fade to Black, starring Dennis Christopher as a psychotic movie geek who takes his love of film to a cable guy level. It's my thing. <laughs> you know what I do to squeeze? <laughs> it's also the best Joker origin story, next to Carney. However, I am still going to clutch my pearls over all the violence that this movie did not cause. Benford is he's sick in the head, he's like retarded or something. And I'm calling for the cancellation of Mickey Rourke. Okay, now let's top this bit off with a Hitler reference. But you didn't know what Adolf Hitler's favorite movie was. Broadway Melody, I bet you didn't know that. Yes, thank you. The movie's gone full internet years before internet outrage. The film has that eye-catching poster, and it's even creepier in the actual movie. Oh, don't show the title. We aren't done yet. Happy birthday, sucker. <laughs> 
seriously see this movie. Forget the Halloween knockoffs. In this one, someone gets attacked by a Halloween poster. Take that, he knows you're alone. Let's get even more horror films in here. Wait, is this secretly, without warning, dressed up like another movie? Oh good, it's Motel Hell. I appreciate that it's the horror movies that are getting the longer trailers. This one's near three minutes. That's all the time you need to learn the secret of Farmer Vincent's fritters. Hey, uh, they're gonna turn me into some hamburger there, Normie. This movie promises you a chainsaw fight while wearing a pig's head, and that's what it gives you. You think in the years to come, people will appreciate us for what we're doing here? Yeah, it'll get a cult audience, but some people like Ebert were there from the beginning. God, I'm hungry. You'll never forget their secret garden. By God, they buried novelist Francis Hodgson Burnett. I can't wait to see this secret. No one will be admitted after the guests check in. Okay, fine. I'll go elsewhere then. We're now on to the movies that are being released on Halloween proper, so they are definitely R-rated. Through the ages, the ancient monuments of Egypt have been hunting grounds for archaeologists. Boo! Get to Linda Blair throwing up pea soup. It's good to see some hardcore archaeology before Indiana Jones. <laughs> Hit the tomb, not the woman, you fool! This killer mummy movie stars Charlton Heston, and it had about as good of reviews as Mountain Men, but at least you can throw this one on for some seasonal entertainment. And it is its own mummy movie and not wasting time trying to build a universe. It's hindsight tolerable. They thought they had buried her forever. If that's the first movie released this Halloween, I can't wait to see the others! Touched by love? That doesn't sound scary! It's got a cover that says, eh, maybe I'll take the kids to the 1980 re-release of Song of the South instead. The movie stars Diane Lane as a girl with cerebral palsy who becomes a pen pal to Elvis. The movie's also called To Elvis with Love, which is a better title. But the more interesting thing is that it's directed by Gus Trichinosis, the director of Side Hackers. I hope that means Elvis and the girl join a motorcycle gang. Okay, well, that movie was a wash. What other Halloween movies you got? Sure. Witch's Brew is a horror comedy that's also called Witch, Witch is Witch. Uh, yes, thanks. My tongue just deliberately stuck itself into a poison apple. The film stars Richard Benjamin and Terry Garr and is based on the novel Conjure Wife, which was made as 1944's Weird Woman and 1962's Night of the Eagle. None of those sound like the same thing! It was the final film of Lana Turner, and had a troubled production that saw original director Richard Shore fired and replaced by Herbert Strock. He directed The Crawling Hand, so we're in safe hands! Oh, wait, no, that's the opposite of what that means. All right, so Halloween's over, so you can take some time out to nurse your hangover. Turns out the witch's brew was like 100% moonshine. Enjoy a drink with your friends in our Hollywood bar. Now that we're in November, we're getting to the actual 40th anniversary of some of these releases, since this video is being released in early November. So where is the 40th anniversary theatrical re-release of The Boogeyman? Come on, you know The Boogeyman. When you were a child, did they warn you about The Boogeyman? No, I was a kid in the 80s. We were warned about nuclear war and bad kids smoking dope, both with an equal level of concern. So what is the boogeyman other than the disco dancers in Prom Night and Terror Train? He hurt bad children and did terrible things to their mommies. On the plus side, he made a lot of great films for Miramax. See, here's your problem. You shouldn't even be living in the Amityville house in the first place. I guess you can't kill the boogeyman only because you'll blow yourself up in the process, and he'll retaliate by making you make out with someone to death. While turning in a profit, the movie was mainly written off as just a Halloween exorcist and Amityville ripoff. But it is the only Uli Lamel film that actually looks like a movie. The boogeyman. He's going to get you. Pfft, I'm not scared. The terrible sequels will take care of him. We are now at the movies released around Election Day 1980. So let's see what movies people were going to after they left the voting booths. Shogun Assassin. 
In the 80s, we loved two things, voting for Reagan and movies about Shogun assassins. This gorgeous film is actually the combination of two different movies in the Lone Wolf and Cub series, one being Baby Card at the River Styx and the other being Sword of Vengeance. Though if you take your glasses off, it's another hilarious SNL movie, this time based on John Belushi's Samurai. He has the power to kill people who then stand there for a moment and wonder, am I dead? Am I dead? Yep, I'm dead. But at its heart, it's a tale of father-son bonding. Meet the greatest team in the history of mass slaughter. It's an interesting list to be on, considering most people on it are in prison! Though these two are killing the hell out of the haunted walls from the Boogeyman. You had me sold with the movie being brought to U.S. audiences by Robert Houston. He was Bobby in The Hills Have Eyes! But just because the disco slasher movies are done for the year, doesn't mean you still can't dance. You got that head turning wall, just talking about. Wow, the discovery of Donny Osmond! This is The Idol Maker, starring the late, great Ray Sharkey, in a film inspired by real-life rock and roll manager Bob Marcucci, who is gonna make sure our nation's girls are falling in love with his stars. He's The Idol Maker. Here he is, my love. Until Moses threw a tablet at him, which caught him on fire. This is all setting up for when Ray starts singing himself while taking up a career as a gangster in Cop and a Half. The film also stars Paul Internet Rabbit Hole Land as a Frankie Avalon type, who even in this fictitious world is going to inspire anyone who wanted to sing to high schoolers about being a beauty school dropout. But from an idol maker to a film idol, it's Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull, shot in black and white so you know it's the Stardust Memories universe. The Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull, let's hear for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to confuse the one guy who thought this was the Bronx Bull. The film garnered multiple Academy Award nominations and a win for Robert De Niro for Best Actor. There's a lot of bad things, Joey. Maybe it's coming back to me. Because if he didn't win, he was going to slap the hell out of the voters. It's great to see the film's more dramatic roots after the later entries got really cartoonish with Jake ending the Cold War and getting Joe Pesci a robot. Boxing was rough back then. There was always chairs being thrown and garbage everywhere. It was good they took away the rule that you can't just shoot your opponent. That made the fights too fast. What more can I say about this classic film? It's great in every sense of the word. And if Twitter existed back then, it would have been very pissed for years that ordinary people won Best Picture. As if both films can't be great. I think this next film wanted to get as many Oscar nominations as both of those movies, but, uh, didn't quite work out that way. The most controversial motion picture of its time. Excuse me, I was already told that Caligula was the most controversial film of the year. Wake me when Christofferson feeds testicles to a dog. So Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate, a bomb so big it contributed to the end of the new Hollywood era and the bankruptcy of United Artists, had its premiere on November 19th, but was such a critical disaster that a wider release happened in April of 81 with a less than stellar shortened version. We cover all of this in our three-part episode on the film, but let's look at the trailers that were made when the film was supposed to be out around Christmas. Michael Cimino the Academy Award-winning director of The Deer Hunter. Introduces his brand new buddy film, Hubris and Clout. This teaser is like you're watching a fan slideshow they made for their film class. Tell me what it's about! Another time of hope and courage. Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. What a weird way to describe that 90s suicide cult. It was nice of them to let Ken Burns do the teaser trailer, but seriously, spoiler alert, Another trailer has to do with an L.A. premiere for the movie that was supposed to happen after the disastrous New York premiere. On November 21st, in a special reserved performance engagement. So special, it did not happen and was pulled after New York. It tells us for the 1,000th time that he made The Deer Hunter, give me one trailer that says from the director of Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. I prefer that movie. So get your tickets never. Reserve performance tickets now on sale at the Plitz Century Plaza 1 and 2. 
Again, that didn't happen, but we have plenty of tickets left over for the Boogeyman! With Heaven's Gate gone from the Christmas lineup, don't worry, we still got some classics! Hey, hey, hey. Yes, cinema has been saved! Ah, uh, the idol maker has done it again in this look back at 1994. In 1994, the world is controlled by one power. Yes, 1994 was controlled by enjoying bad movies, ironically. Thank God we still had some cocaine left over from Xanadu, otherwise Menachem Golan's The Apple might not have happened. This trailer is trying hard to sell me. The Apple is success. It's not. The Apple brings you everything. That's kind of true. It's about learning the hard way not to drink things given to you by record producer Satan. This is like if Phantom of the Paradise just snorted Paul Williams whole. I've never been so high in my life. I know. Kudos for featuring I'm Coming without showing the suggestive lyric, I'm Coming. Though it does have its ode to speed. I'm surprised they didn't hand that out for free to anyone who bought a ticket for it. Wanna know more? The episode is on our archive site, along with Can't Stop the Music. Sure, you could take the kids to the 1980 Betty Boop compilation, Hooray for Betty Boop, but eh, the election's over. Wait until it's re-released in 84 as Betty Boop for President. As for now, take the kids to the visitor instead. I can't explain it, Raymond. No, oh, she scares me, Raymond. Because you gotta go somewhere if you're working off that speed from biting into the apple. The Visitor, about good and evil fighting over a girl with telekinetic powers, has many surprises. Her name is Katie Collins. She'll be eight years old. She's also Jack Black. Also, it's about the spirits telling John Huston to do a movie about phobias. The film is a 1979 Italian film, but got its U.S. release in 1980, and stars Stephen McCaddy, Roseanne's grandma, a director, Henry Ford III, Django, Italian horror movie cameo, and another director. This Christmas, you're gonna die, but goddamn is it gonna look gorgeous. Now that it's December, what else could we throw on for the Christmas movie season? Mm, no, I don't recall the severed penis having a tiny Santa hat. The is eight, two. Mm, not that one either. You're supposed to puke your guts out after Christmas dinner. Ah, uh, how about this movie? It has snow in it. You are cordially invited to a weekend in the country with mom and dad. Uh-huh. What's the catch? Oh, wait. The catch is that it's a change of seasons. A big movie bomb, but no one really noticed after Heaven's Gate. The film is about a married man having an affair with Bo Derek. <laughs> oh, boy, what a lover. You'd like to join me? Why is this the plot of half of Bo Derek's movies? What makes this one different? With mom, dad, dad's lover, and mom's lover. You can't make love. Seems complicated. How did this not do well? Uh, with mom, dad, dad's lover, mom's lover, and their daughter. I'm sorry, is the trailer guy having a stroke? Mom, dad, dad's lover, mom's lover, their daughter, the daughter's lover, and dad's lover's dad. Good God, it's like paying theater prices to see a sitcom that has more misunderstandings and predicaments than an episode of Three's Company. Sounds confusing. Oh, no. Sure. No, no. Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, yeah. What did you say? Hold it. <laughs> I think the laugh track wanted too much money to be in the film. Anyway, enough with the town and country of its day. Let's slow things down a bit with the competition. The competition. The most important moment in their lives. That's because no one's gotten a Nintendo yet. The movie stars Richard Dreyfuss as a concert pianist and... That is your first husband. That you, you marry it. You cleave to it. Because it gives your life a center. It's also about mom trying hard for an Oscar. I see Amy Irving has taken up classical music after leaving country music behind. The movie's all about the rules of playing piano. They broke the cardinal rule of the competition. They fell in love. Okay. Really? That's a higher rule than don't poison your opponent? After a change of season skyrocketed my ADHD into oblivion, I guess this one had to bring it back down. The Competition. The movie was up for Oscars for Best Film Editing and Best Original Song. It did not win those competitions.
Okay, let's get some color in here. After all, it is the Christmas season. Uh, the Universal logo is taking its sweet-ass time. Uh, wait, this is something different. Ah! Yes, it's one of the most glorious theatrical experiences you could have in 1980. Flash Gordon is director Mike Hodge's combination of comic book fantasy and rock opera. A way better Queen film than Bohemian Rhapsody. Produced by the legendary Dino De Laurentiis, it is classic De Laurentiis. The movie wasn't a success here in the States, but has become so beloved that it actually is getting a theatrical re-release for its 40th anniversary. It is beautiful comic book joy with wild sets, imaginative action, perfect music cues, and an all-around memorable movie experience. And speaking of gorgeous films not appreciated in their day... I'm Papa, the sailor, and I am what I am. Robert Altman's Popeye was at first written off as a disappointment, and even had some analysts predicting it would be Evans Gate in reference to producer Robert Evans. But the film did still make its money back and turned in a profit, just not as much as they wanted. It still gained a lot of love over time, as the movie definitely shows its admiration for the Popeye comics to the classic cartoon to old Hollywood musicals. It's not afraid to go full cartoon slapstick and still be heartwarming. It's perfectly cast between Robin Williams as Popeye and Shelley Duvall as Olive Oil, who both embody these characters. Plus... <laughs> Popeye fights a giant octopus. Sold! There's also more laughs we've got this season, but with a smaller budget. I hereby sentence you to serve 125 years. <laughs> Don't worry, they're going to Brubaker's prison. Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor are together again after the classic Silver Streak, this time to take on prison life. Hello. Hey! <laughs> Just like in Shawshank Redemption. With these two comedy kings, Sidney Poitier's Stir Crazy was the third highest grossing film of the year with a very entertaining trailer that knows exactly when to pose for the poster. Only these two guys could dress up like woodpeckers and get framed for robbing a bank. I don't know, sounds like something the Joker would do to someone. Plus, the trailer ends on a twofer. That's right, that's right, we're bad. Uh -huh. It shows us one of the most quotable lines, and again, poses for the poster and a trailer still shot. December 1980 was a month in which comedy reigned big, and it's easy to see why. They're on to a sure thing. Clint and Clyde are back in any which way you can. We have the return of Clyde the Orangutan. I am seeing this. The film has the winning combination of being a sequel to the 1978 hit film Every Which Way But Loose and having Clint Eastwood beat the shit out of people. Hey, Meadow! Get that! Right turn, Clyde. Did I say Clint? Yes, Clint gets in his share of fights, but I am here for the Clyde shenanigans. Come back here with my Oreos, yeah. No cookies are safe from Clyde. He dunks Oreos like he tears apart cars. They're maulin' malicious mobsters. Clyde easily could have taken on James Bond much better than Jaws did. Movie, please. You don't have to keep selling me. It's the most knuckle-busting, gut-wrenching, brain-scrambling, butt-bruising, lip-splitting brawl of all time! If only Raging Bull used that tagline, maybe it would have won Best Picture. But the best part of the trailer is the shot that it leaves on. Any which way you can. That's a man who's very surprised his biggest hit of the year was his monkey movie. And the next film was an even bigger hit than that. A tribute to anyone who has ever been overworked, underpaid, and pushed to the edge. Here's Swimming with Sharks. Oh wait, it's the comedy classic 9 to 5. They arrive promptly at 9, because if they're not on time, they know they'll get the sack. I miss when trailers felt like the short educational films riffed on Mystery Science Theater 3000. This trailer doesn't show much of the movie, but it is way more clever than just showing the sky like Oh God Book 2. It's a story of three female office workers having enough of working for 1980 Matt Lauer. That it's time to get back at that man. Yeah, 
but seriously, you probably shouldn't bring a gun to work. The film was the second biggest hit of 1980, right behind Empire Strikes Back. And yes, the trailer does show us the leads. Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Dolly Parton will be let out of this filing cabinet we've stuffed them in only if you make this movie a box office hit. But we are still technically in award season, so surely there's still some dramas. For more than 40 years, the most important discovery of this century has been kept secret. Ooh, the invention of pizza rolls! Oops, sorry. The formula is about the fight over synthetic fuel created by the Nazis. Who'd have thought you'd have a movie starring George C. Scott and Marlon Brando, and based off a best-selling book, directed by John G. Avildsen of Rocky, and is like the All the President's Men of Nazi Fuel movies. In a world starved for energy. And the trailer even features In a World. But none of this could match the comedy powerhouses of December. The movie didn't do so well, and reviews weren't great, with Avildsen being angry that his cut wasn't the one released. Plus, it looks like Brando is being propped up with a thousand farts, especially when George C. Scott is acting his ass off. If I were in the murder business, I'd blow your brains all over that Venetian line back there, right here, right now. By the end, the movie looks like a bizarre television debate between Bob Dole and Dick Cheney. Even the next movie is largely forgotten. I can sense melodrama. The poster has the same post-apocalyptic color scheme as Windy City and Independence Day 83. Also, Jesus, bro! So what's this one about? Take one blind poker player. Now, add a man without hands. Great, my chef is drunk again. The movie is about a group of disabled people who love to get together and drink. A basketball player with one leg shorter than the other. He's clearly got it the best out of the group. As for Rory... And Rory, who crippled himself. Well, he did survive a fall from 30 stories. The film stars John Savage and was the first film role of David Morse. The group all comes together to help their friend with his basketball career when they're not trying to drown each other. I'm sure this one had a Richard Donner cut, given Donner directed it as a means to take his mind off the Superman 2 drama. But really, the movie is a love story between two people who hate each other? And it's the story of what happens when one friend moves on from the bar. It's not just a bar. Carry its family. Rory, I think you have a drinking problem. Though it does end by going full, Jesus, bro! It'll make you feel good again. And that ain't bad. Two for inside moves, please. I was told it ain't bad. At least much better than the next movie. In concert, he has played to sold-out crowds wherever he has appeared. Ooh, Kenny Loggins? On record, he has sold more than 50 million copies. Okay, um, the character Paul Simon played in One Trick Pony? In his first starring role, Neil Diamond is the jazz singer. Ah, Neil Diamond in his first of many starring roles in movies that are called Saving Silverman. Okay, it's been joked about for years, but how is Neil's acting? I just don't want to go through life thinking I could have been. I love my father. I'll never do anything to hurt him. I've seen worse. I can see how he attracted the attention of both the Razzies and the Golden Globe for Best New Star. The movie was a critical flop, but not a financial one. While it performed under expectations, it still brought in a profit, and the soundtrack was wildly successful and was Diamond's biggest selling album. Plus, it's a better movie than Masked and Anonymous. But still, you're better off watching The Simpsons parody. It's only 20 minutes, whereas this one is near two hours of awkward. The Jazz Singer. It's good. Okay, enough of the awkward. Where's the jazz? What an inspirational story of a 39-year-old boy and his dream of making it big. In case you don't own the album yet, we'll pose for the album cover at the end. You're welcome. Thankfully, the next movie is a bigger hit, so of course it's a comedy. It's Neil Simon's Seems Like Old Times. After Oh Heavenly Dog, Chevy couldn't settle on one comedy hit with Caddyshack. He needed two comedy hits. Chevy is forced to rob a bank and goes on the run, which feels like the book he was writing in Funny Farm. The movie reunited Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn after foul play, which was also great. 
And with this cast, you know you're going to get something extremely funny, especially with Charles Grodin, who brings in the big dogs. Beethoven, what are you doing in this movie? They're getting off. Come on. Come on, get down. Why am I always the last one in the neighborhood to get into bed with you? He's less mad because he knows how much dirtier it'll get. Not sure if Caddyshack and Private Benjamin are still in theaters, so of course I'll go see this. A comedy for Christmas. I want quiet in this court. Yes, I got my Christmas wish. A proper Beethoven's third. Our last two movies were released on Christmas Day proper, so you know they're gonna get into the holiday spirit. Merry Christmas, here's Ken Russell's Altered States. Did you not get a proper high off of The Visitor? Relax. This story of a scientist practicing sciencing the shit out of himself has got you covered. What the hell was that? They're stressing out their audience more than the in-laws. And I'm not gonna listen to any more of your bumbo jumbo! See, this guy even went the full mumbo jumbo. But if you still need a comedy, we got John Larroquette and Bob Balaban, you'll be fine. Hallmark Christmas movies back then were dark. The most terrifying experiment in the history of science is out of control. Scientists were bored in 1980. They wanted to see what would happen if you set rabid dogs loose on the homeless. You know, for science. Okay, so we are ending things on a comedy, so does that mean that December of 1980 is finishing out the year strong? The President of the United States, Bob Newhart, is the President. Well, it's, uh, ending things a little weird. Written and directed by Buck Henry, this is First Family. Oh, the uh, Senator from Rhode Island. I wish we could go back to the classier presidential days, like the one in First Family. The movie also features Gilda Radner as the first daughter, Madeline Kahn as the first lady, plus Richard Benjamin and Harvey Corman as the first Benjamin and first Corman. They all needed presidential pardons after Herbie Goes Bananas and Witches Brew. I think this movie is trying to make comedies great again? Remember when comedy was king? <laughs> Yeah, the biggest hits out in December of 1980 are comedies. I think it's still king. Well, First Family wasn't one of those big December comedy hits, but again, law of averages, you put this many funny people in a movie, it'll have a few laughs, even if the movie's largely forgotten. What a year it has been for movies, and yes, I'm sure there's some that I've forgotten, but don't worry, when I do the 1981 video, I'll open it with an Oscar-style in-memoriam of movies I've left off. But remember, I was spotlighting U.S. releases and wide releases, so you're shot on shitty movies Movie shown in five basements doesn't count. But here are the snob awards for the best of 1980, the ones you should seek out on your own. In alphabetical order, American Gigolo, The Blues Brothers, Caligula, Cruising, Dress to Kill, Flash Gordon, The Hollywood Knights, Mad Max, The Shining, Xanadu, with special premarital sex love to Friday the 13th. And a shout out to Raging Bull so that film Twitter doesn't get mad at me. I hope you enjoyed this wild ride through the films of 1980. We'll have to do this every year. That way, by the time we get to 1981 in 2021, I'll have properly got in my nap after being exhausted from doing this long-ass episode! I said fui, and I mean fui. Fui. <laughs> Thank you.